Good morning. I like them better. I'd like to call to order the May meeting of the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents. But before we begin our business this morning, I'd like to welcome Regent Randy Simonson, who was just elected yesterday. <laughs> Regent Simonson was elected to represent Minnesota's first congressional district on the Board of Regents. Randy lives in Worthington and is co-founder and chief executive officer of Cambridge Technologies. He's no stranger to the university, earning his PhD here in veterinary microbiology, and two of his daughters are also graduates of the university. So, Regent Simonson, we've welcomed you. Do you want to make any comments before we start our agenda? Just, it's, it's an honor to be here, and thank you very much, and I look forward to, uh, to this whole process. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, we will begin today's meeting by recognizing the University of Minnesota award recipients, National Academy inductees, National Scholarship recipients, and our NCAA champion athletes. President Kaler and Provost Hansen, let's uh, wander over to the podium and, uh, and start this. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, I am honored to be here today with President Kaler, Chair McMillan, the Board of Regents, and members of our university community to recognize a number of outstanding faculty, staff, and students who've made particularly important contributions to our university. This morning we'll be recognizing the recipients of the following awards. The distinguished McKnight University and McKnight Land Grant Professors, the McKnight Presidential Fellows, Newly elected members of the National Academies and other major faculty awards. Newly named members of the University's Academy of Distinguished Teachers. Individuals who've received either the Horace T. Morse University of Minnesota Alumni Association Award for outstanding contributions to undergraduate education or the outstanding contributions to post-baccalaureate, graduate, and professional education award. Recipients of the John Tate Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Advising the Outstanding Community Service Award, the Community Engaged Scholar Award, the President's Award for Outstanding Service, National Scholarship Recipients, and NCAA Championships. During the ceremony, when your name is announced, please come up and join Chair McMillan and President Kaler at the Regent's Seal for a photo. Then step to the right and wait for the rest of the recipients of your award to be recognized. Then we'll ask you to pose for a group photo before walking around the horseshoe to greet the Regents and then returning to your seat. Our first awards are the Distinguished McKnight University Professor Awards. These awards recognize and reward our most outstanding mid-career faculty. Recipients are honored with the title Distinguished McKnight University Professor, which they'll hold for as long as they remain at the university. The grant associated with the professorship consists of $100,000 to be expended over five years. The winners were chosen because of their scholarly achievements and their potential for greater attainment in the field the extent to which their achievements have brought distinction to the University of Minnesota, the quality of their teaching and advising, and their contributions to the wider community. Recipients will receive a medallion and a certificate that reads, the Regents of the University of Minnesota, on the advice of the faculty and the Executive Vice President and Provost, hereby appoint the faculty member as the Distinguished McKnight University Professor in recognition of outstanding academic achievement with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities attached thereto. It'll be signed by Brian Steves, Secretary, Eric W. Kaler, President, and David McMillan, Board Chair. There are six recipients this year. David A. Chang, History, College of Liberal Arts. Every day. 
Martin Craven, Physics and Astronomy, College of Science and Engineering. Satish Kumar, Chemical Engineering and Materials Science, College of Science and Engineering. <laughs> Glenn Reisman, Child Development, the College of Education and Human Development. Michael Travisano, Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior, College of Biological Sciences. Natalia Tritiakova, Medicinal Chemistry, College of Pharmacy. So it's the group photo now. So please join me in congratulating these distinguished McKnight University professors. McKnight Land Grant Professorship, which is a two-year appointment that includes a research grant of $25,000 in each of two years. Recipients will receive a certificate today that reads, the Regents of the University of Minnesota, on the advice of the faculty and the Executive Vice President and Provost, hereby appoint you as a 2018-2020 McKnight Land Grant Professor in recognition of significant potential for academic distinction with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities attached thereto. It will be signed by Brian Steves, Executive Director, Eric Kaler, President, and David McMillan, Board Chair. There are nine recipients this year. Uh, Mehmet Akchayikaye, <laughs> Electrical and Chemical Engineering, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Elaine O. Young, English, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. Ron Blackman, Genetics, Cell Biology and Development, College of Biological Sciences, Twin Cities. <laughs> Catherine Gerbner, History, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. Crook Magnuson, Neuroscience, Medical School, Twin Cities. Uh, we thought we saw Esther earlier, but Crystal Ng, Earth Sciences, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Three additional recipients of this award, and, and we're not sure that they were able to attend today, but let me just give their names. Brian Steinman, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Swenson College of Science and Engineering, Duluth, just in case. Ian Tonks, Chemistry, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. And uh, Filippo Coletti, Aerospace Engineering and Mechanics, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Well. While they're doing that, please join me in congratulating our newest Midnight Land Grant professors. the McKnight Presidential Fellows. This program gives three-year awards to exceptional faculty who have been newly granted tenure and promotion to associate professor to recognize their accomplishments and support their ongoing research and scholarship. Recipients will today receive a certificate that reads, the Regents of the University of Minnesota, on the advice of the faculty and the Executive Vice President and Provost, hereby appoint you as a 2018-2021 McKnight Presidential Fellow in recognition of significant accomplishments and great promise for future academic distinction. With all the right privileges and responsibilities attached thereto. And it will be signed by Brian Steves, Executive Director, Eric Kaler, President, and David McMillan, Board Chair. So the five recipients this year are Dahia J. Barr Anderson, Kinesiology, College of Education and Human Development. Gordon Birch, Information and Decision Sciences, Carlson School of Management. <laughs> okay. 
David J. Flanagan, Chemical Engineering and Materials Science, College of Science and Engineering. Michael Galope, Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature, College of Liberal Arts. <laughs> William C. Pomerantz, Chemistry, College of Science and Engineering. Please join me in congratulating our newest McKnight Presidential Fellows. We'd like to recognize those individuals who've been elected to the National Academies, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and those who've received other major awards. The National Academies, comprising the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine, are private nonprofit institutions that provide expert advice on some of the most pressing challenges facing the nation and the world. These organizations produce groundbreaking reports that have helped shape sound policies, that help inform public opinion, and advance the pursuit of science, engineering, and medicine. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences was founded in 1780 and is an independent policy research center with an elected membership that conducts multidisciplinary studies of complex and emerging problems. The Academy's elected members are leaders in various academic disciplines, in the arts, business, and public affairs. Inducted into the National Academy of Science this year is Mikhail Schiffman, Professor, Physics and Astronomy, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Not. Also inducted into the National Academy of Sciences, but a, unable to be here is Peter Reich, a Regents Professor, Distinguished McKnight University Professor, F.B. Hubachek, Senior Chair in Forest Ecology and Tree Physiology Resident Fellow, Institute on the Environment, Forest Resources, College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, Twin Cities. So, the, yes. <laughs> Thank 
The American Academy of Arts and Sciences inductee was also not able to be with us today, that, but this is Ruth Shaw, professor in ecology, evolution, and behavior, College of Biological Sciences, Twin Cities. <coughs> Next, we have four faculty who were granted particularly prestigious fellowships. First, the Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, which provides significant support for scholarship that applies a fresh perspective from the humanities and social sciences to some of the most pressing issues of our time. This was awarded to Erica Lee, professor of history in the College of Liberal Arts and director of the Immigration History Research Center on the Twin Cities campus, who will use the $200,000 awarded over a two-year period to support her research and the eventual publication of a book entitled Fear of the Stranger, A History of American Xenophobia. And then the Guggenheim Fellowships, which recognize scholars who have demonstrated exceptional capacity for productive scholarship or exceptional creative ability in the arts. This year we recognize three fellows. Carl Elliott, Professor, Center for Bioethics and Pediatrics, Medical School, Twin Cities. Professor, Chemistry, College of Science and Engineering, and Associate Director of the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology, Twin Cities. And Chris Larson, Associate Professor, Art, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. Chris could not make it today, but congratulations to all of these honored faculty members. And now we'd like to honor those who've been named to the University's Academy of Distinguished Teachers. First, we recognize the recipients of the Horace T. Mann University of Minnesota Alumni Association Award for Outstanding Contributions to Undergraduate Education. Each year since 1965, the University of Minnesota has recognized exceptional teachers for their outstanding contributions to undergraduate education. This award recognizes excellence in contributions to student learning through teaching, research, and creative activities, advising, academic program development, and educational leadership. The award represents the highest recognition by the university community of its most distinguished scholar teachers. Recipients will receive a certificate today that reads, 
In recognition of excellence in teaching, advising, research, and creative activities, academic program development, and educational leadership, the Senate Committee on Educational Policy, in conjunction with the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost, and the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, confers upon you the Horace T. Morris University of Minnesota Alumni Association Award for Outstanding Contributions to Undergraduate Education, and it's signed by Jennifer Goodno, Senate Committee on Educational Policy Chair, Eric W. Kaler, President, and David McMillan, board chair. This year, we recognize Cheryl Breen, Political Science, Division of Social Sciences, Morris. <laughs> Jonathan Gewurz, Psychology, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. David Mathis, Biology, Teaching, and Learning, College of Biological Sciences, Twin Cities. <laughs> Keith A. Mays, African American and African Studies, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. Award winners could not be with us today, but let me read their names. Jeffrey G. Bell, Management Studies, Labowitz School of Business and Economics, Duluth. Mitra Ahmad, Anthropology, Sociology, and Criminology, College of Liberal Arts, Duluth. David Fox, Earth Sciences, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Tracy Otten, Studio Art, Division of the Humanities, Morris. So please join me in congratulating all the recipients of this year's award. inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Teachers are the recipients of the award for the outstanding contributions to graduate and professional education. In 1996, the Senate Committee on Educational Policy, SCEP, initiated discussions about establishing an award for graduate and professional teaching that would parallel the Morse Award for undergraduate teaching. SCEP members realized that many exceptional faculty members are ineligible for the Morse Award because their contributions to the university's educational mission come primarily from teaching and mentoring graduate and professional students. SCEP and the provost at that time together established this award, which recognizes faculty members for excellence in instruction, instructional program development, intellectual distinction, advising and mentoring, and involvement of students in research, scholarship, and professional development. Recipients will receive a, a certificate today that reads, in recognition of excellence in instruction, instruction program development, intellectual distinction, advising and mentoring, and involvement of students in research, scholarship, and professional development. The Senate Committee on Educational Policy, in conjunction with the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost and the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, confers upon you this award for outstanding contributions to graduate and professional education. It's signed by Jennifer Goodno, the Senate Committee on Educational Policy, 
Committee Chair, Eric W. Kaler, President, and David McMillan, Board Chair. The recipients of the award this year are Victor Barocas, Biomedical Engineering, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Bradley G. Clary, Law School, Twin Cities. E. Dan Dahlberg, School of Physics and Astronomy, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Barbara E. Martinson, Design, Housing, and Apparel, College of Design, Twin Cities. Alexander J. Rothman, Psychology, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. <laughs> Alexander, oh sorry, Barbara Young Welke, History, College of Liberal Arts and Law School, Twin Cities. Additional award winners couldn't be with us today, but let me mention their names. Chris Paola, Earth Sciences, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities, and Robert E. Porter, Veterinary Population Medicine, College of Veterinary Medicine, Twin Cities. So please join me in congratulating the recipients. Our next award is the John Tate Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Advising. This award is named in honor of John Tate, Professor of Physics and First Dean of University College. That was in 1930 to 41. Tate Awards recognize and reward high quality academic <laughs> advising and call attention to the contribution academic advising makes to helping students formulate and achieve intellectual, career, and personal goals. By highlighting examples of outstanding advising, the Tate Awards identify professional models and celebrate the role that academic advising plays in the university's educational mission. The recipients of the award this year are Mark A. Bellacourt, Senior Academic Advisor, Student Services, College of Education and Human Development, and the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, Twin Cities. Thank you. 
Michelle L. Page, Associate Professor, Division of Education, Morris. Sarah Schroth, Senior Academic Advisor, Minnesota English Language Program, College of Continuing and Professional Studies, Twin Cities. And one who could not be with us today, Tracy Boland, Director of Advising and Academic Services, Leibovitz School of Business and Economics, Duluth. Please join me in congratulating the recipients of this year's Take Awards. President Kaler will present the next awards. We have so much to celebrate, it takes two of us to do all the announcing. Thank you, Provost Hanson. Our next award is the 2017-2018 Outstanding Community Service Award, which recognizes the contributions and accomplishments of faculty, staff, or university-affiliated community members who have devoted their time and talent to make substantial contributions to the external community and to improve public life and the well-being of society. This year's recipients are Susan Ann Gust, our Community Partner Award winner. <laughs> Student Anak Nakik of our College of Science and Engineering on the Twin Cities campus. Jim Kruger, a building and ground supervisor at our Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve and faculty award winner Jane Ann Murray of our law school, cannot be here this morning. But please join me in congratulating all of these exceptional community members and university citizens.
Our next award is the President's Community Engaged Scholar Award, which recognizes one faculty or PA individual annually for exemplary engaged scholarship in his or her field of inquiry. Recipients demonstrate a long standing academic career that embodies the University of Minnesota's definition of public engagement. And this year's recipient is Associate Professor Lisa Covington Clarkson of the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, College of Education and Human Development on our Twin Cities campus. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next award is the President's Award for Outstanding Service, which was established in 1997 to recognize faculty and staff who provided exceptional service to the University of Minnesota. The award is presented each year and honors active or retired faculty or staff who have gone well beyond their regular duties and have demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to the university community. And this year we have several recipients. We'll begin with Kumar G. Balani, Distinguished International Professor, Professor of Anesthesiology, Medicine and Pediatrics in the School of Medicine, Twin Cities. Karen Brown, Director, Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change, Global Pro Programs, and Strategy Alliance, Twin Cities. <laughs> Steve Cisneros, Director, President's Emerging Scholars Program, Office of Undergraduate Education, Twin Cities. Sue Elm, Clinical System Supervisor, School of Dentistry, Twin Cities. Thomas Gillum, Administrative Director, Master of Healthcare Administration and Executive Program, School of Public Health, Twin Cities. John Hamlin, Professor, Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and Criminology, College of Liberal Arts, Duluth. <laughs> Lindell King, Director and Chief Curator, Wiseman Art Museum, Twin Cities. Sharon Kressler, Administrator, Any e. Witchell School of Earth Sciences, College of Science and Engineering, Twin Cities. Masterman, Associate Program Director, UMN B Squad, and Extension Educator, Twin Cities. <laughs> Colin McFadden, Technology Architect, Technologies and Innovation Services, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. And I don't believe he's here. Okay. But we could clap for it. That's a good idea. <laughs> Ed.
Abdi Smal Samatar, Professor, Department of Geography, Environmental Study and Society, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. And Terry Sutton, Communications Associate, Department of English, College of Liberal Arts, Twin Cities. Please join me in congratulating these exceptional university citizens. now recognize students who are recipients of select national scholarships. Our first is Merrick Pearson Smella, Chemistry and Biochemistry CSE Twin Cities, who's been selected as a 2018 Churchill Scholar. tell you that the Winston Churchill Foundation of the United States, which provides this fellowship, was founded in 1959 to offer American students of exceptional ability and achievement in the sciences, engineering, and mathematics the opportunity to pursue graduate studies at Cambridge. Merrick is one of 14 seniors from the top colleges and research universities in the United States to be selected as a Churchill Scholar, making the $60,000 award one of the most selective and prestigious postgraduate scholarships in the country. Next, we have two recipients of the Fulbright Award, which promotes international goodwill through the exchange of students in the field of education, culture, and science. They are Chloe Fuyu, Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior, CBS, Twin Cities, who can't make it this morning because she's taking a final exam. <laughs> Tate Shepard, Theater Arts of Spanish and Portuguese, CLA, Twin Cities. Hmm. Maybe an exam taker. <laughs> Next, our Goldwater Scholarship recipients are being honored as among the nation's outstanding sophomores and juniors who intend to pursue research-oriented careers in mathematics, the natural sciences, or engineering. The scholarships provide up to $7,500 per year for up to two years of undergraduate studies. And the Goldwater recipients are James Cox, Chemistry, CSE Twin Cities. <laughs> Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior, CBS, Twin Cities.
Please, another round of applause for these exceptional students. And finally, we recognize our NCAA champions for this 2017-18 academic year. First is Sarah Bacon, NCAA one-meter diving champion from the Twin Cities, and I believe she's here with her coach, Kelly Kremer. Caitlin Long is the NCAA, NCAA champion in the track and field weight throw. She's from the Twin Cities, but she also can't be with us this morning because she's taking a final exam. <laughs> and last, <laughs> and last but not least, Regent McMillan, the 20. 18 NCAA men's ice hockey champion U of D Bulldogs. The Bulldogs are represented today by captains Carson Kuhlman and Parker McGee and by teammate Louis Rail. And they're joined by UMD Athletic Director Josh Burlow. I get to, uh, as chair, you get a little bit of discretion to intercept and interrupt uh, facilities and tours and, uh, and awards like this. So without further ado, I'm going to unfurl two banners and break tradition here. But uh... <laughs> and what, what you have there is the 2011 and the 2018 banners for, uh, for the hockey team. And to our diver, I looked all over every bookstore in the whole system, and I could not find a pennant for diving, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, what a great honor. You make us proud, and uh, let's get on with pictures and celebrations here. First, on behalf of the athletic department, including our men's hockey coaches who are recruiting, trying to win next year's championship already, and we want to congratulate all the award winners here. I want to thank Chancellor Black, President Kaler, Regent McMillan, and of course the board for their support, our fans, our faculty, our staff, and students, uh, and the 18,000 or so folks in St. Paul a month ago who made sure that we had home ice. But most importantly, uh, we'd like to present Regent McMillan, who's been to just a few men's and women's hockey games over the years in Duluth. a replica version of the trophy. <laughs> Pictures with me with the regents later. <laughs> Thank 
With that, we will conclude our awards ceremony. Provost Hansen and I thank you all for coming, and especially thank the faculty, staff, and students whose significant contributions have brought distinction and excellence to the University of Minnesota. resume the uh, the meeting here and I would uh, start with asking for a motion to approve the minutes from our uh, March meeting so move second any uh, corrections or additions to the minutes hearing seeing none all in favor <coughs> aye aye opposed very good those are approved and we turn now to president Kaler's report thank you mr. chair uh, I'd also like to begin by welcoming uh, our newest regent uh, who has already gone on this first break oh there we go good Randy. Uh, regent Simonson rather uh, welcome uh, I'll take the point of personal privilege to uh, tell the group that uh, I had the opportunity to meet regent Simonson uh, for the first time uh, in 2011 and when my first trip to greater Minnesota and Farm Fest. Uh, we went to uh, Newport and Worthington and a variety of places and had the chance to, uh, to meet Randy and his business and uh, reflect on his pride as, uh, as a golden gopher and uh, we welcome him with enthusiasm to the board. So welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. So happy commencement season to us all. In many ways, this time of year and its celebrations really are at the core of what we do <clears throat> and who we are. I've already attended the CFAN's graduate student uh, commencement with Regent Johnson and our College of Pharmacy ceremony with Regent Anderson. Today I'll be attending the CFAN's undergraduate commencement with Regent Powell, and there I will be introducing one of our university's great friends, Lando Lake CEO Chris Polisinski. Each of my commencement visits this year reflects my commitment to our university's statewide impact and our land grant mission. With our College of Pharmacy's campuses in Duluth and the Twin Cities, and it's the only professional pharmacy college in, college in the state. And CFAN's influence is frankly incalculable in all 87 of our counties. Across all of our campuses, there are thousands of accomplishments this year. At UMD, Chancellor Black proudly tweeted that 2,245 students received their degrees last week with the help of Regent Lucas. At Crookston this academic year, we have 439 graduates and about half of them were online only students, a hallmark of UMC's innovative role in our system. 
At Morris tomorrow, 354 graduates, including a just-named Fulbright Teaching Scholar and a 2017 Udall Award winner, will march and be honored to hear Senator Amy Klobuchar as the commencement speaker and greet Regent Omari, I believe, as the regent. And at Rochester, following tomorrow's commencement, 100% of our Bachelor of Science and Health Professions graduates will be employed in their field, and of our Bachelor of Science and Health Sciences graduates, 86% are pursuing professional or graduate school. So we think UMR is truly on target. In the season of success and passage, we helped to facilitate a private good for almost 16,000 graduates from our five campuses. But just as importantly, I remind you, we also witnessed the confirmation of an extraordinary public good as our newest alumni move into the nation and the state's talent force and make a real difference in their communities. It's a very special time and we should all be proud of our graduates and of this remarkable university for its unmatched role of driving economic and cultural prosperity in our state. Let me offer a brief report on what I've been up to since we last met as a board in March and a few other tidbits of note. Of course, I've been spending much of my time advocating for the university's capital request and our supplemental request. The drive from Morrill Hall to the Capitol is quite familiar. I was pleased with the recently announced House and Senate bonding bills, which clearly recognize that higher education is and should be an important part of infrastructure investments across the state. I remain hopeful that the allocation for HEPR will grow closer to our request as the legislature and the governor negotiate a final capital investment bill. On the philanthropic front, our Driven campaign has now raised more than $2.8 billion. We've had very successful campaign launch events in Arizona, Florida, and New York. Dallas is coming up soon, and I've attended various on-campus launch events, including an especially fun one for our Pride of Minnesota marching band. I've been spreading the word about our university's impact globally and locally. I spoke last month up to our remarkable ICOMOS conference. ICOMOS stands for the International Conference on One Medicine, One Science, and I applaud College of Veterinary Medicine Dean Trevor Ames and Professor Srinaram Rao for their work in making us a world leader in this One Health space. That conference brought more than 400 thought leaders from around the world, from Brazil to Turkey to Uganda gathered on our campus to explore new ways to solve pressing health issues. It's the third time we've hosted this, and we now have a partner in Chiang Mai University in Thailand. Also, our university brand was promoted on the global front by the University of Minnesota Duluth's Financial Markets Program when its five-student team won the National Chartered Financial Analyst Institute Research Challenge. Domestically, the UMD team beat out more than 400 other American programs. All students in our Leibovitz School of Business and Economics, they took their U.S. title last month to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. They didn't win there. I blame the judges for that. <laughs> That's a boxing reference. But they did us proud in analyzing the inner workings of Minnesota's Fastenal company. More locally, I spoke last week to about 300 business leaders as part of Carlson School's first Tuesday lunch, detailing just how well we've done as a university over the past seven years. I was pleased that Regents Beeson, McMillan, and Omari could attend. A week ago, I traveled to Brainerd to speak at the Brainerd Lakes Chamber of Commerce to highlight our, highlight our statewide impact and to celebrate the work of our University Extension Central Regional Sustainable Development Partnership, which is helping that community create a national loon center. Congressman Rick Nolan, an advocate in Washington for the Loon Center and someone who deeply fe fears the extinction of our state bird in the coming decades, was in attendance as were other key Brainerd Lakes area elected officials and education leaders. Let me turn to athletics. As you know, I've been deeply engaged in reform efforts at the NCAA. I'm the chair of the NCAA Division I Board of Directors and we've been working hard to alter the landscape of men's college basketball. Last month, I was in Indianapolis with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who chaired the Independent Commission on College Basketball, as she announced a set of sweeping reforms to keep college basketball true to its amateurism ideals. The NCAA staff and boards are hard at work on implementing the recommendations. On the ice, as you all know, since we last met, the UMD Bulldogs won the NCAA Men's National Hockey Championship. Regent McMillan, Chancellor Black, and the entire UMD community, I think, are still recovering from that achievement. And we're all very excited about the hiring of CEHD alum and Olympic gold medalist Lindsay Whalen as our Gopher women's basketball coach. 
And every time I mention Coach Whalen's name at public events, I usually get spontaneous applause from the audience, for her, not for me. It was a great hire by Athletics Director Mark Coyle and adds tremendous buzz to our entire Gopher program. Finally, uh, back to a matter of business, I understand there is a desire among several regions to do a deeper analysis on our Minnesota resident tuition levels. We will bring that modeling to you between now and the June meeting and we'll show the impact of a range of tuition levels. So on that happy note, Mr. Chair, I conclude my report. Thank you, President Kaler. Well, first, I'd like to once again offer the board's congratulations to all the individuals we recognized this morning. What a great opportunity to see the scope and breadth of the students, student athletes, staff, and faculty, their accomplishments, and how proud they make us every day. The end of the academic year is always a wonderful time to look back on the past year and celebrate accomplishments. It's also the time of year when we uh, participate in commencement ceremonies. Those have already kicked off some, some month, uh, weeks ago, some uh, continuing through this weekend and into, uh, into next weekend and in the next few weeks. To cross this time frame, my colleagues and I will participate in 30, <coughs> yes, 30 commencement ceremonies conferring degrees to graduates across our, our system on all five campuses. And as you've come to expect from me, I always like to use this opportunity to connect our agenda items back to the board's priorities that we outlined uh, coming out of our retreat last July. So a couple of those we're highlighting today. Yesterday, the Mission Fulfillment Committee affirmed our commitment to preserve and enhance the university's academic excellence and reputation by recommending an outstanding class of faculty for tenure and promotion. And uh, last night we had an opportunity to slow down a little bit and spend some time yesterday during the meeting and again last night with a uh, broad array of those newly tenured professors recognizing they in many ways are the future of our university. So that's been a great opportunity for us. Um, another one of our priorities is to achieve the vision for an integrated academic medical enterprise and later in our meeting today we'll have an update on where we stand with the uh, very important and consequential M Health agreement. More on that as uh, the meeting unfolds. Along with that we'll hear from Dr. Toller on the system-wide strategic plan for the uh, medicine and health areas and this addresses our priority to complete a system-wide strategic plan that incorporates an academic investment strategy and a long-term financial framework. Outside of our meetings, my colleagues and I have been working on our priority to increase private and public support for the university's mission through conversations with legislators about the university's capital request which focuses on renewal of critical resources and by way of our consent report, which is another thing that we tend to uh, drive by without stopping and uh, recognizing the scope and uh, amount of gifts that are in there, our consent report always contains an amazing array of gifts from the private sector that support that priority and the university's driven campaign. Yesterday we reviewed the President's recommended fiscal year 2019 operating budget. I want to remind everyone what Regent Anderson announced yesterday at the Finance and Operations Committee, and that is that the Board is interested and cares deeply about your feedback and the public's feedback on this budget. We will take action on the budget at our June meeting, and we are providing two ways this year for you to share feedback. First, you can submit written comments via the Board of Regents website. This is an excellent way to provide feedback for us. These are published in our docket for the June meeting and all regents have access to them and they will be part of our official record. A second opportunity or two actually will be a plan where we're planning and ready to implement two public input sessions, one on the Twin Cities campus and another at UMD. These sessions will provide you with an opportunity to engage in conversation with regents and administration about the budget and more information on dates and locations is available at our website. Finally, each May the board establishes a committee for the purpose of evaluating the performance of the president. This year regents Powell and I and one regent yet to be determined will serve on that committee and I will uh, have more to say on that as May unfolds. That concludes my report. So jumping into our agenda again, item five, the uh, consent report, I would uh, entertain a motion to, uh, that's a review and action item as it is every month to uh, move and accept that. So moved. 
Good. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. That, uh, that carries and we are into our system-wide strategic plan. And I mentioned that in my report a few minutes ago, bringing together two of the board's highest priorities, our focus on academic medicine and our focus on strategic planning. And uh, Dr. Tolar, do I see you there? You are right there. And uh, while you're approaching, President Kaler, maybe you'd like to uh, provide some context and launch this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I certainly would. Uh, so today we will hear the third presentation from leaders of our system-wide strategic planning oversight committee. As you know, we're moving forward diligently and thoughtfully on this plan. After Dean Tolar's report on medicine and health today, we'll be hearing at the board's June meeting from Executive Vice President Provost Hansen, who will report on teaching and learning priorities. And at the July meeting, Senior Vice President Burnett will make a presentation on how we will be supporting the mission going forward. I look forward to sharing with the board a more complete picture of our strategic plan in the coming weeks, which will then lead to a broader consultation across the university system. In September, you'll be asked to review the plan and the 2020-2021 biennial budget request. Mr. Chair, I'm pleased with how this process is evolving and I'm thankful especially to Regents Powell and Rocha for their support suggestions and encouragement. Before I hand this over to Dean Tolar, let me just spend a minute discussing the work we're doing in assessing the future of our work in the health sciences. As you remember, when you approved the appointment of Dr. Tolar as Dean of the Medical School last, last December, it was coupled with his appointment of an interim Vice President for Health Sciences in order to provide an opportunity to assess our current academic health structure. In the, the intervening few months, I have solicited input from members of my cabinet, the deans of the health science colleges, center directors, and other stakeholders associated with our work in this area. Additional consultation is required, but I'm nearing recommendation on a new structure. I have three primary goals in this area. Strengthen collaboration in the research and teaching missions of our work in health sciences. Integrate and align the operations of the Academic Health Center and enhance the focus on the clinical enterprise and streamline the responsibilities for the Dean and VP. I'm continuing to assess potential leadership structures for our work in the health sciences, which includes an examination of how the work is distributed between the Executive Vice President Provost, the Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, and the Vice President for Research plan to continue consultation with faculty and university leadership before presenting a more formal proposal to you in the near future. I believe there are great opportunities to enhance our work in the health sciences across all disciplines, not just those housed currently in the traditional AHC colleges. The time is right for this assessment, and I look forward to future conversations with you about this soon. And with that, I turn the podium with your permission, Mr. Chair, over to Dean Tolar. You do have my per permission, certainly, and uh, Dean Tolar, welcome. We're honored to have you at two consecutive meetings of the board. We had you in Rochester and here again today, so I know you're busy, and uh, we're, we're honored to have you. So take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Regents. Mr. President, uh, this is a deep privilege and honor to be here and report on how we're going to make the medicine and health the highest achievement of this university. So you have provided the guidance all along, and uh, I have been very grateful to everything that you have put into in personal context or in other communications that helped us shape our thinking about where we need to go and what we need to do. The priority, of course, always is to serve the state. I take very seriously the command of the land-grant university that we are, and serving the community is the number one priority. Everything else is secondary. The secondary aim, of course, is that we need to be excellent if we want to serve the community well. So that's where your directive on increasing the prestige of the medical school and health sciences, that's where it's coming from. The aligning of the strategic priorities of the state with our universities, of course, a great part of what we are doing today with aligning the resources and bringing them as a concerted power on what we need to achieve <coughs> in the training, in the research, in the clinical care that is the front door for our community. We are 
achieving this through very diligent and disciplined process of strategic planning that is, uh, again, following your directive you know, from last April and the directives beforehand, and is pointing to the ability, to necessity, uh, to come to the healthcare planning with ability to lead the changes that are happening on the healthcare market. So we are no longer satisfied by being the best. We are no longer satisfied by catching up to others elsewhere. We are now in a position, I believe, to be truly the creators of the field and creators of the change that is leading, leading forward. In the first part of the, of the strategy and the systemic-wide plan, it has to have economic stability. There cannot be possibly a success while we are trying to accomplish some of the basis of how we survive in the economic market. So that's why I've taken to heart, and my team as well, your directive to establish a healthy partnerships with our clinical partners. And you have been very helpful and dominant you know, in the thinking and execution of multitude of these strategies. And we will have some tactical asks for you today and later uh, this month and next month uh, to help us achieve that. But once we have cemented the economic basis of our clinical partnerships in the adult and in pediatric medicine, then we are going to, again, following your thoughts in doing few things, but focus on them relentlessly. So I am a big believer in we have to be good at what we do well. We actually can be only best in things that we already are doing well. And then focusing on the few priorities and then obsessing about them. And this way, I think, we will be the best servants to the community, to the state of Minnesota, in ability to anticipating an innovation of the future healthcare, which is changing dramatically, and I'll get to this in a moment, but also in ability to bind together all the five missions of the medical school and the health sciences in a way that, that makes a holistic sense. So the five pillars of the mission of the medical school and, and health sciences, in my opinion, are education. We lead with education. This is our way of creating the workforce in the state of Minnesota. People who train with us stay in the state of Minnesota. We, will pro we, we produce, if you will, majority of the professionals in the clinical space in the state. The community benefits from the concerted effort to provide the care and, and clinical access to the greater Minnesota. And there is no way that the patient care can be provided at the highest level without research. And that's where your university, my university, is essential player in the society. Because there is no other place, to my knowledge, that is in the society that is able to say, this is a standard of care, but it doesn't work. The standard of care is that everybody dies, so you cannot follow in good conscience the, the standard of care. The only way that I know that has worked in the history of medicine that is effective is that you bring in research, you bring that problem to the lab, you bring that problem to the clinical trials, you, you figure out what is going to happen in congenital heart surgery, what is going to happen in cancer, what is going to happen in Parkinson's disease, what is going to happen in psychosis treatment, and you will disassemble the problem, find out how this can work together, and then bring it back to the clinical trial. This is uniquely a domain, in my opinion, of the academia, and that is where, and that's the fifth pillar, that's our legacy that is continuing, you know, over the last 130 years, is continuing to today. So there's no transition between past and present and future, in my opinion. It is a continuum of things, and I think that we can take an analogy of Minnesota being the North Star and look at what we have at the university as a constellation. And uh, I've chosen Pleiades, you know, the picture there is from uh, Galileo Galilei in uh, 1630s, and we are literally steering by the stars. And a concrete, with no pun intended, uh, example of that is our new health science education center that you have supported, and that is bringing the interprofessional education, the team science, and, and, and team uh, clinical care together and bridges over you know, what we have to accomplish in the health sciences. 
So you look at the map on your left, and you see the dots, you know, where the colleges uh, that are clustered now in the health sciences space, where we are. We are everywhere. We are everywhere in the community. This is remarkable because I, I guarantee you that if you looked at maps of other states in the union, you would not see the same thing. The change, of the, the the fraction between the metro and the and the greater state is not the same as it is in Minnesota, and it's a great, I think, testament to the to the to the quality and persistence and loyalty of this university to the state that we have been able to achieve that. So I'm going to use the Pleiades, you know, the uh, the constellation of the six sisters, you know, that the ancient mariners used to use as a as a guide for their uh, for their sailing in the Mediterranean mostly, and go through uh, each of the schools in the in the health sciences space. So school of pharmacy, school of pharmacy is in two uh, has two campuses, has uh, over 200. Uh, uh, preceptors in the states has uh, been phenomenally effective in different partnerships and answered at your command two biggest epidemics, if you will, and two biggest changes in the state, which is the opioid crisis and the mental health care that we provide or, you know, for what I would argue, many times we don't provide. And we have been successful to position ourselves with our colleagues at the Pharma School of Pharmacy to design a methodology that tracks the retail drug prices and, and is able to design ways whereby uh, the citizens that are older than 50 years of age can navigate the very difficult market in the, in the state and in the union. The second start is veterinary medicine. The College of Veterinary Medicine has an impact and prides itself in its impact in rural Minnesota. They do this through training uh, veterinarians in, uh, in, in smaller cities, you know, in the, in the state of Minnesota, and they have used a platform, again, of the state need, and this would be in the avian flu, for example, to get access to these communities and to really be relevant, you know, in these communities. They have a pipeline of the community outreach, you know, in partnership with the Kirkston and Morris campuses, and they have been very proactive, I think, in the in the service to the community in a way that they provide the uh, the, the pet care for lower income families and households. We are uh, now in the in the uh, way teaming together, you know, and, and being able to show you examples of how the collaboration works. Because without doing these things, this is just words. And one of the examples that I like is uh, there's a brain tumor called glioblastoma. This is the one that you sort of put your things in order once you have that scan in front of you, because you have about four to six months to live. And there's no good treatment for this. And at this university, at your directive, there has been a incredible research done by Dr. Allen first, and then brought you know, to the neurosurgery, Dr. Hunt and Liz Bluhar in the veterinary medicine, and trying to design a vaccine, a vaccine using immune, immune system to clear the cancer, which is very innovative, to bring about a vaccine that would treat the pets, the dogs in this sense, and the humans alike, which is unbeatable combination. School of Dentistry, uh, again, a school that has been priding itself on community and rural training and has been able to achieve number of partnerships that have been very relevant you know for the people in Minnesota again you see the density of the map and where where people are and using the same approach as I showed you previously with the School of Pharmacy, looking at what does the state need, they have been the first one nationally, internationally recognized for being able to design a methodology whereby the opioid prescription in the dental offices you know, are disciplined and streamlined. A major, major advance and major recognition across the state and, and the union. School of Public Health is one of the oldest schools in the uh, in the health sciences space that we have at the university, and uh, the, the 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 phenomenal advance there is the focus on the social determinants of health and how can we measure outcomes of what we do in clinical care and how can we bring it about again in a research way to change the policies and to change how, in their example, to help taconite workers help people that are uh, with disabilities and uh, uh, say uh, women that are pregnant and on Medicare. 
The one example that I like is the uh, ability to design a methodology how to connect with other parts of the university, and in this case, with um, the water pollution. So this is not what you would typically uh, count into the health sciences, but it m makes sense, right? Because these pollutants affect human health, animal health, and affect the state. So Dr. Simchik in the School of Public Health was able to design a sponge that can be put underground and, and filter out these, these toxic compounds called perfluorinated uh, uh, compounds that have been, uh, have been spread you know, through, the, through the groundwater Order and as a result of, of um, several companies' activity. Well, nursing. So um, everybody who has ever been in the hospital or in the clinic with any kind of a problem will remember their nurse. The nurse is the person who spends most time with you, more than I do, more than a physician d does, uh, and they are the ones that you know usher us to the life. They are working with us through our travails, you know, through the life, and then, then, uh, then assist us, you know, getting out of this, of this, of this life as well. So they are something that I have always uh, considered the compassionate, the immediate, the 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 decisive. Uh, platform in the in, in, in health sciences, and this school of nursing has been phenomenal. They have uh, truly led uh, the efforts, you know, that uh, that that have shaped how we look at patient care in the in the state, and they have been able to design a innovation innovation in a way that has been spreading across the operations and research itself in a seamless way. And a good example of that, in my opinion, is the nurse practitioner clinic that they have unveiled recently. This again gets national recognition. This is where you want us to go, you know, to be recognized nationally as a health sciences group. And uh, and do something innovative. So many people are reluctant to see a physician. You know, they are reluctant. You know, they nurses better. You know, for for many of their needs, there can be uh, also. Uh, Sort of, uh, they, they like you know the more time perhaps that the nurse practitioner can spend, and they are phenomenal at what they do, and it has been an immediate and very bright success. Medical school number six star. So you have been uh, leading this uh, in in many many ways. So thanks to your predecessors who signed us into existence on the April 26th of 1888, uh, we are now 130 years in running. And we are uh, doing as well you know, as, as we possibly can under the circumstances. But there are very many things you know, that have been star achievements. But I don't think you know, this is where we stand and this is where we're going to stay. This is really just, as I mentioned, the continuum between the past to the present and to the, to the future. So we have a statewide impact. You know, there is no question about that. We have a campaign slogan that I think can capture this. We train your doctors. You know, this, is, this is the people that you put in this medical school are the people you're going to see in your office. And your loved ones will be taken uh, care of by them. We have been very uh, focused, very intentional about cultural link relationship with our legislators. You know, we have had a number of friends, you know, on the Hill, and they have understood, you know, that the, 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 the path, you know, that we have is shared one. And as a reflection of that, we have been able to receive funding for regenerative medicine. In my opinion, this is the, the dominating and dominant feature of medical care in the 21st century. We have received medical discovery team funding, which has been profiling the team science in a way that has not been done before. And as I'll mention, you know, we, will, uh, we, we have been able to enhance our ability to enroll patients in the cancer clinical trials by having some funding from the uh, from the state as well. And as, uh, as you know, we are very disciplined about where we go. So what we need to do are the three, four, maybe five at most fields in which you want to be excellent. And the numbers speak for themselves. We have 135 medical specialties that we cover. Uh, we have more than 2,000 clinical trials. This is very, very high. This is very good. And anybody who has have ever looked at the data from the clinical trials knows that people who are enrolled on clinical trials, oncology or otherwise, do better than those that are not, because it's a more organized and more accountable environment. We have uh 
400 plus principal investigators, these are the best and brightest individuals. These are exactly the people that you want because they are able to bridge the basic, typically, the basic science to the clinical care delivery. They are these physician scientists that are able to get things done. But, you know, as much as we use uh, the, the publishing in top tier journals as a, as a metric of, uh, for tenure, for promotion, for, you know, some of the, you know, uh, uh, establishment of our peers, you know, in the, in, the, in the nation, no top tier paper has saved anybody's lives. It doesn't improve anybody's care until you make that jump to putting that knowledge from the, from the top tier journal into the clinical care guide guideline or clinical care trial. So we have been very diligent about harnessing the complexity of the healthcare that we are facing today, which in my opinion is no longer a solo effort of anyone because it's just too complex. So the answer to the complexity of healthcare, the answer to the complexity of, of medicine, of human condition in, at large, is team, is team science. And the medical discovery teams that we have four of, which are biology of aging, that unquestionably is you know, a dominant uh, 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 factor in the society, which is led by Dave Benlor, uh, the ruler in American Indian Health, led by Neil Henderson, uh, the addiction uh, one led by Tim Ebner, and uh, the optical imaging and brain science led by Kamil Ugorbil. So if you look at, uh, as I started with, you know, it's, it's no longer good enough, in my opinion, to go and catch up on people that are leading you know, our fields. We have to be in a position to create these fields. So Dr. Ugorbil is the one who creates the field in magnetic resonance. You know, if there, is, there are a couple of things that we can unquestionably say we are number one in the world. This is one of them. And on that same uh, platform, there are people that preceded us, and we are still living of the, exactly the same field-shaping discoveries as Dr. Ugorbil is doing and others you know, that, of my colleagues. In my own field, Bob Good, you know, with bone marrow transplant, that unquestionably established you know, our priority in the field, and we are building on these things. That's the theme. You can get best at things that you are good at, kind of. So that's where the cell therapies, regenerative medicine, immune therapies of cancers are coming. And of course, uh, Earl Bakken, who, who started the, the, the whole thinking about combination of engineering with biology. And I think that in his... Uh, in the same way of, of his thinking, what we are seeing is that the, 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 the future of medicine is actually on the boundaries between the engineering and, 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 and biology. So let's see a couple of examples of this. Recently, we have been the, the hospital that separated the, uh, the two conjoined twins. You know, this was one of the highest uh, hits you know, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the web. And uh, this, th this is a great example for me because it combined masterful surgery, uh, masterful NICU care, medical device center, you know, something that these surgeons, you can actually print these conjoined hearts in the medical device, in the 3D printer, right? And they train on this, and then they go to the real, uh, the, the real operating theater and do the surgery right. This is where we need to be. This is where the creativity goes. We have been able to be a part of the national effort to spare you, you know, colonoscopies, biopsies of, you know, lumps and, and, and whatever, and doing what we call a liquid biopsy from the, from the blood. So we know that over 70% of cancers can be diagnosed from a simple blood draw. And we are taking that knowledge and putting it, partnering, and that's where the strength is, partnering it with the MinDrive funding that we have gotten from the legislature for enhancement of the clinical trials in the greater state of Minnesota, and we are pairing these together. So one or the other alone would not be efficient, would not be enough. That is where I said, you know, the top tier publication does not give you better care. It is the partnership. If you put it, you know, into the clinical trials, if you get this done in this in this, in this way. Uh, Bob Tranquillo in the biomedical engineering is the person who designed a heart valve and heart vessel that can grow with the patient. So in many instances, we operate on these children at very early age, and then you have to reoperate when they grow up. And again and again, he designed a technology that would not be exist in existence if we didn't have the ability to partner bioengineering with the stem cell biology that can grow with it. And very recently, 
uh, Dr. McAlpine from the College of Science and Engineering partners uh, and, and, and his partners in the, in, the, in the medical school were able to show that not only that you can print a sensor on a, on a moving hand, you know, so instead of going to a doctor and getting the blood pressure down there, you can now have something on your hand like an Apple Watch or a wearable, you know, that will measure your blood pressure, blood glucose without finger stick, EKG, you know, for the arrhythmia and so forth, but also, which I think is exceptional, we were able to show that you can print living skin into the wound in the shape you know, that can be used for treatment. So you see that the bandwidth of the knowledge is, 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 is enormous, in my opinion. And uh, we bring it down to the, to the five pillars of our mission, to the land-grant mission of this university. Do we do well by the state? And I say that with the, with the workforce that we provide, you know, 70% physicians, 67% pharmacists, 73% of dentists, more than 50% of veterinarians and 67 doctors of nursing practice. This is where people train and stay. They are loyal to this state. They are loyal to this university. And that's why I think we are effective in what we are trying to achieve. So the, uh, the, the strategy here and sort of backing a little bit, you know, into where I started on the slide three, uh, what is the, 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 the foundation of the strategy? And I said it is the clinical partnerships. That's true. The economic fitness, you know, is in my opinion, opinion the, the, the fundamental from which where we are going to start. And again, I am grateful to you for your, uh, for your assistance in this and guidance in this, you know, in this process. So we've been able, as a result of this envision, not just, uh, you know, the, the, the clinics and hospitals we have, but also the partnerships we have around the state and the ability to go from one uh, health science field to another one and do this in a seamless way. So the strategy, strategic systemic-wide plan has several dominant features. And one is the ability to serve the state. The other one is to be absolutely the best version of a medical school and health science schools we can be today. And the third one has to be the, the, the enormous emphasis on the interprofessional education and team science, the ability to bring people with distinct uh, knowledge, experience, diversity, inclusion, bring them together to work together on what matters to all of us. All of us. So the, the goal here is to build a uh, destination center to be able to compete on value in the clinical care to focus on the few research priorities and then obsess about them. And lastly, to improve the, the, the standards, to change the practice of medicine based on all of these things as they are overlapping with the changes in the healthcare markets, which are tremendous. The healthcare has become, in December of 2017, the largest employer in the United States. It overtook retail. This is unsustainable. If you ask me you know, what the answer for that is, it is not hiring more doctors. It is not hiring more nurses. It is to be smarter about this. And I see the, the, the confluence of, of big data, of ability you know, that everybody has an iPhone, everybody you know, understands you know, their, and cares about their own health, as an enormous opportunity to bring to bear on the examples that I showed you, the, the engineering, the, 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 the law, the, the business, the agriculture, and all of the other health sciences uh, schools together. And this is where I think we will uh, remain uh, competitive. And this is how I think you know, we will bring to you what really matters, which is the change in the lives of people that we serve. And uh, in my opinion, that is how the land grant mission turns around almost and closes the loop. Because in my opinion, the improvement of the healthcare and the access to healthcare is a fundamental human right. An improvement in the healthcare that is done under your supervision is a moral, not just economic, but moral imperative. Because this is how people really live. And this is how people that we know uh, will or will not have good lives. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today about the vision for medicine and health and uh, about strategic plans and system-wide plans, how we're going to get there. 
and I look forward uh, to your feedback and direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Tolar. And uh, while I'm no astrology buff, I, uh, next time I'm asked what sign I am, I may say I'm of the Tolar constellation. So, <laughs> but, uh, um, seriously, I uh, find you, and I know my colleagues do too, to be uh, inspirational in your breadth and depth of, uh, of things you can manage. I doubt too many of your colleagues have a bandwidth as wide as yours and deep as yours right now with all that's going on in the Academic Health Center, adult pediatrics and otherwise, and then to show up here and deliver that kind of overview of where we're headed on a strategic basis is deeply appreciated by the board. So I have only one substantive comment, and that is I share your perspective, the economist in me, about the unsustainability of the, the industry and where it's going to, uh, whether it, I hadn't heard that measure of total employment, but the 18, 19, or 20 percent of uh, GDP that uh, that is cited frequently about what the healthcare you know, side of our economy consumes is probably another measure of unsustainability. So no matter what else we're doing here, if we're helping to create a sustainable future for that, we're doing good things. I'm going to open this up to uh, to my colleagues now. I'm sure there are questions and uh, and feedback that uh, they'd like to elicit from you. Regents, Region Rocha. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Tolar, thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> as I as I listen to you, just kind of describe what I would uh, call your vision uh, for how to move this forward. I. You know, I'm, I'm struck by the my limited um, knowledge of you know essentially the interplay of all of these things, and, 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 it, and it dawns on me that you might be completely full of it in what you're presenting to us. Uh, but I don't think you are. Um, I like very much what you're saying, and um, and and am inclined to um, you know fully support this approach to the alignment of these very important elements of what this institution does. Um, I'm struck by a couple things. Uh, you know, one is we're now starting to get a little bit more uh, detail yeah, as you kind of talk about some of the, the specifics um, and, and to the extent that we can continue to do that and, and have continued clarity in what that will mean for us as a board as we allocate resources, that will be very helpful. Um, I also understand where we are in this process, and so I'm not, it's not a criticism, but it's a, an encouragement uh, to continue to give us even more clarity. I'm also struck by the fact that what you were seeking to um, pursue um, is very difficult and, and will take a lot of, of um, I, I, for uh, no other word, a lot of courage on your part to continue to pursue the things uh, as you described, the things that we already do well that will let us then uh, be um, exceptional, uh, and, and, and that you know ultimately that will come with some pushback, I'm sure, uh, at times. And, and I want to at least speak for myself here, and, and uh, I'm very interested in the perspectives of, of my fellow uh, board members. Um, you will have my support. Uh, you will have my strong support in, in, in identifying these places where we, as an institution, uh, can be exceptional. Um, and, and you know, much as we have in certain areas um, uh, in, 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 in the past, that has led to uh, the perception and, and the reality that the University of Minnesota is is um, a lead among its peers. I mean, I, I, I believe the university is. I believe that the the, um, the ranking processes tend to uh, have a bit of a skew, but nonetheless, um, we all have a desire to uh, restore that. Uh, recognition that, that we have historically had. And so just understand that uh, when when the pushback inevitably comes, understand that at least from, from my perspective, you have the support from this level to say this is precisely what we're seeking to do to, to reach that, that level of excellence. Um, I, I want to make one comment because it does start, it, you know, potentially crosses into a bit of the, of the public discourse. Uh, you close by, by referring to access to health care as a basic human right. Um, without getting into the substance of it, you know there, that of course is a debate um, as to what what constitutes a right. But I will I will say this: um, I think that we should treat it. We should treat it as a basic human right, uh, without answering necessarily the the, the rudimentary question. But um, everything that we do um, to create. Um, 
better access to health care moves it closer and closer into the realm where it's accessible to anybody. And so that we, we should treat it that way, we should pursue it that way, and, and certainly understanding that health care is not necessarily limited to just the University of Minnesota. We, we very well uh, in the state of Minnesota will benefit if uh, a, a school in California comes up with a response to a critical health care crisis. Um, and so working together with the, 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 the larger national and global health care, we can identify where we can you know, have that significant impact. I hear that as what you're describing, and, and you have my full support. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Dean Toller. Mr. Chair, Regent Rocha. Um, Thank you very much. You know, this is very articulate, and, and uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly grateful for the fact that you are able to see this, you know, through the lens of the complexity. And uh, as uh, ambitious as my team is on behalf of this university, not personally, but on behalf of this university, I am uh, humbled uh, many, many times, you know, as a physician, as a researcher, as an administrator, uh, humbled by the things that you mentioned. There are, uh, there's a, uh, the first one that you said is, you know, that, uh, and I, I think it was, you know, a, a, a favorable statement, a compliment of sorts that, you know, uh, it looks like, you know, I'm full of it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I, I, I tried uh, to be very sensitive to the, uh, the hubris nemesis continuum. You know, I, I tried to be very careful about not promising things, you know, that we cannot deliver on. And I think that this basic uh, understanding of how uh, our knowledge is incomplete, you know, in, in the in the in the medical and health science world, you know, is is truly a basis of uh, our ability to take some risks in the settings, you know, that require changes in practice of medicine. So I I'm very much in 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 the same line of thinking as you are about the analytical uh, way of looking at things, you know, and. and Analytical discovery for me is a one that maps the the territory that is already known. This is like you know immune system or you know something like synthetic uh, discovery in my opinion, which is the one that goes where nobody else has gone before. This is where Earl Bakken was, you know, in the 50s. This is where Bob Good was. This is where we are uh, today, in my opinion, in our ability to map, for example, a neuron, uh, a nerve cell in the brain, to the whole brain uh, in, as a continuum, to see a single cell and to see how the network of cells is, is operating together. Nobody's been there before. So this is where what I meant by creating fields of, of, of new discovery where we can when we can go. The second point that I very much appreciate is that you have said better than I can, you know, how difficult, you know, this is going to be. And I would say for my team and myself, we are unafraid of this because this is such a substantial essential, existential demand. You know, I personally think that the, the well-being of people is no longer, or has never been in fact, a function of income. It is really of well-being. You know, we, we all know this on a way. So, so the way how we, how we put this, you know, in, in the complexity and difficulty, you know, is going to eventually define who we are. And I personally think, you know, that we are better defined by the overcoming, by the bad things, by the difficult things, than by the easy ones. That we are more defined personally and as a group by the challenges we have to overcome and the resilience that we have to gain in the process. And the last point I would make, I apologize for the phrasing of the fundamental right. You know, I went to the law school just for two years. I never got the degree. I studied medical school and law school at the same time. Uh, I meant it more <laughs> in accessibility. I, I see what we do as a service, as a deep, uh, deep um, layered service to to people in need, you know, to ability to alleviate suffering, in my opinion, is a privilege. And uh, I, I, I feel very strongly about, you know, being a part of this university. I'm immensely proud of being part of this university. So I've been here for 25 years, and I'll, I'll remain that. Uh, because this is externalization of what I think is noble, and thank you for that. Thank you, Dean Tolar, uh, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I have to say it didn't cross my mind that you were full of it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I bought everything you said, and I, I really appreciate 
the um, enthusiasm, the ambition of what you said, and uh, two things struck me: your your trying to your ability to bring it back to the land grant mission. I think is really really important as we go out and try to get support for this. And I love the word obsess. We find a few things and we obsess on them and become great. And we, we break the barriers. And I just love that. So I'm, I'm on your team. Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, thank you very much. You know, thank you for being on the team because I think that uh, there's no one individual uh, at the university that would be dominant in this way and that can really do this work alone. And I think the team is exactly, you know, what you know you just said. You know, which is the this is the answer. You know, for you know how we're going to do things in the in the in, in the future. And the Langrand University, is a, you know, it's difficult for me not not to link it to the. American democracy, you know, to the whole idea, you know, of not having kinks and not having, you know, being really, you know, uh, organized in a way, you know, that is better than that, that preceded it. The land grant mission, I think, is an improvement, a dramatic, you know, not incremental, but stochastic improvement upon a, uh, a, a, a you know, an alternative. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply committed to that vision and mission. Thank you, Regent Lucas. Please. Well, your team is growing, uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dean Tolar. I'm on the team, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I, I see you've taken uh, your astron astronomy theme and you've taken it one step further to Star Trek. <laughs> Only go where no man has gone before. I like that. I like, the, um, uh, I like this presentation better than the one that was actually in our docket. Um, this one... Uh, it's it's even more aspirational. Um, I think we are. We do need to put all the pieces together. Um, I think focusing on the areas, uh, on some areas, a few areas, um, obsessively. I think that's what we need to do. You did mention the word uh, destination, which, as you know, is part of another uh, system theme. And uh, I think we should we should be destination. Uh, the destination for uh, certain things as well. Um, so I think this is a great start. I do think that we need to understand, you know, what the cost of this is going to be and how it's going to be funded and how um, how long it's going to take to get there. Um, I do believe that um, it is possible. We already have one out of every six uh, dollars of state support coming into the medical school. I don't know what it is if you add up everything going into the academic health center. Uh, you might know that, but it, it could very well be two dollars, two of, two of every six dollars, um, which already means that we have a lot of um, financial support, um, but obviously it's not enough, and obviously we have to find uh, ways to get more. And. Um, I have every confidence that um, you'll be able to develop that plan. Very good, Dean Tolar. I'm going to I'm going to uh, not turn the mic back to you because I've got six more regents that would like to talk. So when we get to the end of several of those, or if there are specific questions, we'll let you jump in. But uh, Regent Cohen. Okay. Thank you, Chair McMillan, uh, Dean Tolar. I think you know how impressive I think you are and inspirational. Um, I, I really like the maps of different stars of the AHC, and I think you showed so well the statewide impact as you delineated each uh, <clears throat> part of the AHC and then showed a map of where they were all over the state, which really showed to me how we're fulfilling our land-grant mission. I only wish I were knowledgeable enough to ask a question, but I don't think I know enough. <laughs> Uh, and I'll let you figure that out. But impressive presentation and impressive work. Thank you, Regent Cohen. I'm going to turn to uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you. Uh, I'm only about 24 hours into this, so uh, excuse me if I um, don't know what, what I sound like I know what I'm talking about here. I really did appreciate what you said. I uh, uh, have to be good at what we do well, focused, because on the outside looking in, that's been one of my concerns, especially in some of the areas you mentioned. Um, and then you talked about focusing on research strengths. Can I, going forward, and can I interpret that, what you're talking about here, is the addressing these Minnesota priorities? Is that the areas that you're thinking about focusing on? And, and uh, um, okay, I, I really appreciate that. And then uh, um, 
another concern of mine, and of course I'm from the vet school, so I, uh, I have a little more information there, is what I'll call independent research. With the uh, lack of um, federal funds or the reduction of federal funds, let me say that, F uh, NIH, uh, USDA, those types of things, I'm seeing more and more private research sponsorships. And that gives me some concern, and I don't know exactly what we can do about it, but if there's something the university can do about that, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, that looked at. And would like your comments on that. And then one final comment is, uh, again, what was mentioned as far as budgets and so on, and expenses like that. I'm always interested in how we can um, receive more for our intellectual property. When we outline, you mentioned I think 900 patents or something. Um, are we really getting the return on our investment there? And if not, are there ways we can do better with that? I know some examples again in the vet school where I don't think we have. So, Dean Tolar, I saw you nod on the Minnesota priorities. I don't know if you need more there, but a quick response on private uh, funding and IP. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Simonson, uh, this is as sound, essential. So the NIH funding has increased by three billion, you know, this year, you know, which is unexpectedly good, uh, but it will never be enough. Uh, the reason, you know, why I think, you know, we are not in a bad place with the private sponsorship, even though it has to be very, very clearly delineated who does what and under what circumstances is that a lot of the startup companies, you know, some of them in, in greater Minnesota and some of them, you know, on the coast, if you will, you know, are, in my opinion, an answer how to translate some of these discoveries into the clinical care. Because almost everything that has been done on the big data in the, you know, having a, uh, you know, somebody being in charge of her health, you know, through the digital, you know, uh, telemedicine, for example, has almost all of it been done through the private industry. And I'm not opposed to this. I think that markets are extremely healthy. You know, I think that Adams was right. You know, you cannot do you know everything you know alone and the independent research you know is uh, you know one needs to understand you know I think and and frame you know what, what do we mean by that you know if, if independent in my opinion means solo research doesn't exist it exists in math perhaps in physics uh, but it does not exist in biomedicine I can tell you that because the teams will overcome all of that if independent research means that it's only a part of the university it also does not exist at least doesn't exist very well because the the partnerships and I was you know one of the reasons why I actually sit here is that I was inspired by the by the president Taylor when you know some almost a decade ago when he spoke to the Chamber of Commerce about how we make uh, the intellectual property capable of being transported from the university from academia into the private sector I thought this is it this is good this is a, this is this is really where we can go so the I agree on the priorities I I, I think you know that it's an opportunity, not a problem. You know, having a private sponsorship, but it has to be again ethical, moral, very disciplined, very you know well you know delineated and, and correlated. Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Toller. Thank you for the presentation. Um, this theme about connectedness and alignment. It makes me think that we should have more emphasis in here around our relationship with Fairview. Fairview is almost the same size as the University of Minnesota. They are a strategic partner. We talked about ways in which to deepen that relationship, including having uh, that system be a better platform provider for our research. They deliver the medicine all the way around the state. and. So the scalability, so part of its alignment, part of it is the who are, how do we scale this up in a more significant way. And so I almost consider them part of the, part of the team. I mean, um, and, and um, I, I'd like to see a little more presence. We provide the labor to Fairview for the complex procedures, procedures through the University of Minnesota Physicians. Uh, the other comment, I agree with Regent Chu, I think we almost need a sort of a sense of place or destination, I hate to use that word because it's been taken, but as we build out our medical campus there, and M Health is a good start, but I don't think it's enough 
uh, it doesn't necessarily belong in this document, but uh, a a tag or a brand or something further because it's mm -hmm. that that if done right tells a story. Thank you. Dean Tolar, I know our next item will focus on our partnership with Fairview, but a quick response? Of course. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Beeson, thank you very much for, you've been my guide on the, you know, some of the economic thinking and some of the branding as well. And I, uh, I, I entirely agree with you. The future is, the future as I see the healthcare market, there are 600 markets in healthcare in the United States. The ones that win are the ones that have healthy academic Slash community system. So would we are at a, at a, at a um, you know at a favorable position, as you of course know, after our retreats and the documents, uh, is you know that we we have an opportunity to actually be exactly that. I want to be the dean of the medical school has to be enterprise uh, minded, and the CEO of the healthcare system has to be academically minded. And I have to say that James Hereford and his leadership have been that, and it has not been easy, as you of course know, and it has been a credit not to me, but really the team behind this, which would be uh, General Counsel uh, Peterson, you know, Senior Vice President uh, Burnett, uh, Vice President Kramer, of course, President Kaler, who have led these efforts, you know, in this. But I think that we are achieving, we are close to achieving to what you just said, which is have a true partner, you know, in this. And again, as, as Regent Rocha said before, I am the last person that would, you know, over-promise and under-deliver. I, I am very cautious optimistic, but I do agree with, with what you said. You align, align incentives, align priorities, align strategies. You don't get greedy, and you are you you try to make sure that the squeeze you know is worth the juice that you get out of it, and the juice is good. <laughs> it is good. Regent Anderson, okay, I I won't take long. I uh, I do have to say, just sitting up here. Um, I know Dr. Tolar is a wonderful physician. He's really good at the medical school, but I didn't know you had such good taste in dress. I love your tie today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I just want to say you and I have had, had discussions about the land-grant mission, and you brought that up. You talked about the ability... Um, to, to the state to, to, you know, to help the state. You talked about being patient-centered. Uh, I want to just tie this to something Regent Shu brought up about bringing in new revenues for academic health and the university. You know, a couple of the uh, a couple of proposed reductions we're looking at that I've been concerned with is is uh, we're proposing closing some of the clinics for the dental dental clinics and also some of the marketing for the the vet medicine program. And from my point of view where you had a slide up there that 60% of the pharmacists are trained from here, UMD, and 70% of the doctors and 50% of the veterinarians. I think we do need to find whatever new revenue we can on the top line system so we don't have those potential cuts that probably hurt rural Minnesota more than the Twin Cities area. And that's just a very comment I have and I just do you have any thoughts on that? Dean Toller. Chair McMillan, uh, Regent Anderson, thank you very much for the comment on my tie. I don't pay much attention. You have the same one. That's very good. Uh, you are my example in more than one way. Uh, I would uh, entirely agree with the, uh, with the focus on people in everything I do. Everything you do, everything my team does, people are, you know, the only the, the, the only treasure, you know, this is really where we are at. So we do focus, you know, and the people can be the patients in the community, can be the faculty, can be the nurses, pharmacists, uh, dentists in the community. And of course, you know, our focus on, on training these individuals and keeping them in the state is going to be the, the denominator, if you will, the, 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 the keystone, you know, to everything that we're going to do. So we will do everything possible, you know, to make sure that we protect this, uh, this, this treasure. The uh, the second 
part of the of, of your questions, which was more, again, you know, I'm skipping. I apologize to what Dr. Sh uh, Regent Chu and Regent Rocha have said before, and I think Regent Cohen as well. Uh, yes, the ambition is to elevate this to a higher level structurally, say, you know, quote unquote, a destination of sorts. But I'm not sure that we are there yet. You know, I I don't want to see you know sound uh, limited in this, but I do. I'm very careful about not skipping certain stages in the development. We really need to follow your advice on getting the healthy partnerships first, focusing on few things that we are very good at, and then we will earn the the designation of being a destination. And that's when you know the additional funding would make you know some some sense. And that's the difference between uh, what I would call. Um, uh, sort of uh, complacent optimism, you know, which is the one that you sort of way things are going to happen, and conditional one when you actually build the things, you know, in 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 that path to 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 end up at the at the destination. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Dean Tolar, uh, Regent Johnson, and then Regent Powell to wrap up up here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tolar, for uh, being with us today and all of, all of your work and your team. So I listened to my colleagues around the table talk this morning and with accolades and cheerleading about academic health and medicine and things that we're doing, it's all very, very good, very good. But it's incumbent upon the 12 of us and the president sitting around this table to provide you the resources. We can't just be cheerleaders sitting in the stands. And when I hear discussions about we're going to make cuts or we're going to make reductions, I say to myself, you can't hope for a Cadillac and uh, come with, a, with an empty checkbook. You just, you just can't do that. So in a way, I'm, I'm speaking to my fellow regents as well as to the legislature about what the Min Min people of Minnesota appreciate about this university with high regard, and that's... Uh, the medical school, uh, the uh, medical the hospital, and all the medical services around the state. But we can't starve what you're trying to do. And to me, as a, a person, it's frustrating when I hear these discussions. So, Dr. Toller, what are two or three things that this board can do for you to help you advance your mission? Dean Tolar, you got a couple teed up? <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Johnson, thank you very much for um, the, the clarity around you know, what is needed. Uh, the resources are necessary. You know, they are not sufficient, but they are a necessary condition in a, in a success. I am of the mind you know, that uh, a lot of the resources should be accomplished and brought about by us. You know, not by the you know uh, by the board of regions. You know, not, not by the university. Uh, we we vitally depend on them. You know, that's not the question. But but again, sitting back, you know, and just getting things, you know, is not you know how I and my team thinks. So that was the the part about you know being very proactive about NIH trials. You know, we have we have uh, NIH funding. We have increased by 16 million. You know, in getting funds from business and industry and NIH at the medical school. I think that the the ability to uh, to have a clinical uh, healthcare partner, you know, that is able to support the academic mission of the of the school, falls into this proactive entrepreneurial category, and uh, the 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 ability to uh, to to make this you know funding really relevant, you know, is then going to hinge on the on the several areas, you know, where the board of regents, you know, can be uh, can be helpful. Uh, it is uh, with all humility that I say that uh, the Board of Regents is the, the group to which I and my team looks for direction. So your ability to help us with the, uh, with the guidance in the clinical partnerships, for example, is irreplaceable. I know it's not funding, you know, but this is really the non-monetary value that, it, that, that I think your leadership has been paramount. So your support you know, in, in the ups and downs you know, of the negotiations has been, you know, and I, I will hope, you know, continue to be you know, decisive one. The second one is 
is uh, I look at uh, the, the, the you said cuts you know and and resources I think you know that uh, one has to be mindful of the fact that if you want to succeed in biomedicine you will have to hire people up uh, at the same time you know the the lean concept of having ever running you know a, a business you know because healthcare is you know in this sense a business uh, has to be very mindful of again a directive from you which is to decrease the administrative support decrease the weight of bureaucracy if you will and we've done this you know 12 position over the last years you know we've decreased in the in this mind so so having this connective you know uh, again from from the board of regions you know this directive restructure certain parts of the university restructure thinking you know about how you how you go about this is going to be the uh, the the second one and the third one and I don't want to disappoint you by not asking for money, but the the the, the, the third one is you know to truly uh, stay supportive on where we are you know with the uh, with the allocation that we get from the state. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Tolar. Last word to our uh, our vice chair, Regent Powell, and I'll urge you to be uh, speedy. Thank you, Chair uh, McMillan. Um, thank you, uh, Dean Toller, for your comments this morning. Very inspirational. I just and I also want to acknowledge. I mean, you only stepped into the dean role here, I think, five or six months ago, and 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 that immediately <coughs> into these very complicated and time-consuming negotiations that you've been leading while maintaining a clinical practice. And so, I don't know if you're sleeping, but um, we want to thank you for um, all of the service over the last six months. I also want to thank you for your continued reference during your presentation to the mission. I mean, we want capacity, more capacity, and we have ways to do that, and, we, and more research. We, I think we agree, and we, we want to do these things, and we want recognition that our mission is to serve the state and to serve our patients, and you came back to that several times, and I appreciate that. Um, just a couple of, of, of really comments, questions. I mean, I think you heard um, how much the board appreciates your emphasis on focus, um, and I think you're going to continue to do that and sort of uh, sort of top level strategic decision making. We we like that. But I, I guess I would also add that um, I, I think the board's equally interested in um, as you have more time to devote to this. Where are we going to take our number two, number one pharma school? What are we going to do to improve our vet school? What are we going to do to strengthen the school? I mean, I think that those departmental strategies, uh, in many, they're equally important. They are at a different level, sort of in your domain, but I think you'll find um, uh, a, a very large appetite for that um, that focus as well. So that's a that's a comment. The other one has to do with. Um, I think Chair McMillan touched on this, and it, and it has to do sort of with health care, the, the, the great debate if you, around health care in the country right now. It's kind of like, it's almost the question of our time. I mean, how can we increase access and quality while, you know, reducing from this unsustainable level of spending? And so, and there's a lot of activity going on around value-based health care, which you mentioned in your presentation, which is being picked up by um, the pharmaceutical and device industry. The FDA is trying to lead it. I mean, it's, this is the direction. So I guess the question is, given the very, very deep and strong health ecosystem in our, in our state with, you know, some of the great providers in the world and the center of biomedical, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big area. Can we, should we be contributing more to that public policy debate on you know, the way forward in this sort of health care conundrum that we're in, utilizing, as you said, all the resources that we have in Minnesota. Maybe we're already there. I don't know, but it, it seems like we're in a good position to contribute to that debate, and I'd be interested in your a few brief thoughts on that. I know it's a question in over time. Thank you. Uh Regent Powell, uh, Dean Tolar, maybe just focus on the last of those. There was a departmental priorities and a couple other things. I, we don't have time for that, but I know you will lodge those and be back to them. But on uh, Regent Powell's last question. Chair McMillan, Regent Powell, thank you for the comments. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the last one as directed by the chair. Uh, are we able to be... Uh, you ask, you know, are we a part of the of the debate about the the policy in healthcare? Uh, the answer is yes. Absolutely passionate, yes, because we have the training, we have the expertise, and we do have, you know, one negative thing, you know, which is 
can be turned into positive. We have the structural advantage of general dissatisfaction. You know, people are not happy to wait, you know, 3.5 weeks for an appointment. People are not happy that they are paying more and more, you know, for their health care. People are not happy with a number of these things. So we have, in my opinion, an opportunity, and you alluded to it. I'm just amplifying what you said, not to be incremental, not to be catching up, but really, you know, jump over, you know, really make a leap into, you know, where the puck is going, you know, which in my opinion is digital health, digitized, democratized, reduction of cost and, and, and deep learning technologies, you know, that especially because of, we, of us in Minnesota having the large industry, small industry and the academia in one state, you know, is a tremendous catalytic opportunity to advance. Thank you, Dean Tolar, but I don't think we can excuse you to go anywhere because uh, that was a discussion item and uh, informational in the sense of informing our longer term um, system-wide strategic plan planning uh, work. But this next item with M Health is uh, decisional and uh, for action today. So I would ask President Kaler to review some of the work that has been done, frame our discussion for a decision around our M Health Clinical Partnership. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Dean Tolar. I, you should stay right exactly there, but I think perhaps we could have General Counsel Peterson and Vice Senior Vice President Burnett join you at the table just uh, for ease of fluidity of questions that may emerge in their needed responses. So, Mr. Chair, I'm now seeking your approval for the resolution related to the extension of our M Health negotiations with Fairview Health Services. As you know, we are presented with an opportunity to refresh and reform the university's relationship with Fairview. We have made great progress. Uh, this team has functioned at a very high level for a long time, and we've made significant breakthroughs that benefit all parties. On the other hand, there are still key issues that need to be resolved, and those issues would benefit for more time to negotiate. This resolution would provide an additional month's time to no later than June 30th of this year. I'm thankful to you for your resolve on this issue to date, and I appreciate that this board has played a role in keeping everyone disciplined to design a better outcome from all parties uh, involved here. Uh, but I do recommend your approval of this extension to allow us to complete our work. Thank you. President Kaler, did you uh, want any of your senior team to add any context there, or are we ready to open it up for conversation? Well, Mr. Chair, I believe that uh, the resolution is pretty straightforward, and, I think it is. and the board is, is at a pretty good level of understanding. So in the interest of time, perhaps I will just respond to your colleague's question. Very good. Regents. Regent Shu, then Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I'm supportive of an extension um, as long as we think that this is going to be the last extension. Um, and my question really is, is the 30-day extension enough based on uh, how much still has to be done? Uh, President Kaler. Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Hsu, uh, we believe it is. Uh, we also recognize that, the, that we are asking for one extension. Um, we do not intend to come back and ask for another extension, and we do intend to use this time window as a vehicle to help us with our, our uh, partner come to a conclusion. Follow-up, Follow up. Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. So this uh, extension is to get the letter of intent uh, completed, then at what time would we be looking at the definitive documents and being able to approve those? President Kaler. Mr. Chair, uh, I would ask uh, whoever wants to answer that question <laughs> to do so. From the field. Mr. Burnett. Mr. Chair McMillan, Regent Hsu, <clears throat> the current plan with uh, our partners is that by September 1, not later than September 1, uh, and to your prior question, the Fairview Board intends to vote on the letter of intent on June 14th, and it has already gone for one review by the Fairview Board at the April meeting, and as one of Jacob and I serve as two of your four board members on the Fairview Board, um, we're not anticipating um, that being a challenge at the Fairview Board. Board. So the, we, we believe the June 30th is a good date. And I would add, uh, as the regents are aware, we're working hard to schedule one immediately following mm -hmm. the June 14th meeting of our own, a special meeting. So one, one more follow-up. One more follow-up, Regent Chu. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, 
I guess the, the other question is uh, whether or not the pause part of this is going to cause any um, delays in, um, in time. President Kaler? Um, I'm a little reluctant to dive into a, a, a public conversation about that subject right now, so I would ask the, the general counsel perhaps to provide us some perspective on that. <clears throat> general counsel Peterson. Thank you, Chair McMillan. I'm Regent Shu. I think President Kaler's caution is appropriate in that um, there are a lot of um, uh, business interests at stake that are under sort of negotiation here with parties beyond um, the public institution of the University of Minnesota. So I think we all have to be respectful that our other partners have lawful confidentiality concerns that we as a public institution need to respect. So I think it su suffices to say that um, you know, in this healthcare space, as Dean Tolar sort of outlined, it's complex and we're intertwined in many ways in many practice areas, including um, the pediatric arena. And so all of that is a um, intertwining set of conversations. We're optimistic that we're moving on many fronts in a successful direction, which will uh, make the June 30 deadline make sense, not only vis-a-vis -vis Fairview, but vis-a-vis -vis all of the other considerations at stake. And um, there's certainly reason for hope and optimism as uh, Dean Tolar's presentation reflected this morning. <coughs> Hopefully that's sufficient for mm -hmm. now. Thank you. Very good, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and perhaps I can get uh, some more information on this um, offline, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the interplay of the vote we would take in June and the bridge to get us from the letter to the to an actual agreement. And, and so to just understand, I'm, I'm sure there's an answer to that, but um, that, that is a question that comes to mind. I, um, <clears throat> I, I've presented in the past some of the concerns with you know things that that I would like to to uh, see us address in any letter and or uh, subsequent agreement to, with you know particularly in relation to uh, governance questions and and uh, <clears throat> you know the the demarcation of the, the the various entities that are involved um, I don't think we need to revisit that now um, I I want to make sure that as you go into this this sort of home stretch of the conversation that you ha you are empowered with a board that has resolve um, and and so um, and, and to that extent you know if, if, if you think it would be helpful I'll vote against the resolution just to demonstrate that there is still some healthy skepticism <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah I just 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 ensure that we don't take our you know our, um, our foot off the pedal on this and that and that uh, you know, this is so essential. I, again, I've, I, as you know, I've been a bit of a skeptic um, about this arrangement because of some of the DNA components of the two entities, and, and, and um, again, by um, you know, wowed by the uh, enthusiasm of, of, of Dean Tolar, I've, I've been listening to some of the opportunities that we may have to really get this where we are in a true partnership. Mm -hmm. When I read about some of the disputes. Um, that, that exist still between the entities, it, it gives me pause in, in saying, well, if we're really on the same page, these things should be, we should be able to address those. And I understand that these things do take time, and there has been some of a uh, requirement of a cultural shift. Um, I also want to make sure that this is a partnership that results from a, uh, uh, from symbiosis as opposed to we're trapped in a contract for a long time. And, and so to the extent that we aren't able to meet some of these benchmarks, I want to make sure that we as an institution are going to have flexibility for our successors as a board um, to, to be able to uh, to make the necessary corrections to, per, to pursue the vision that, that Dean Tolar just presented to us and not force them to wait generations before they can uh, escape what, what may be a troublesome arrangement. Um, obviously, we don't go into the marriage expecting a divorce, but nonetheless, we want to make sure that, that uh, um, we are being sound that way. So. Um, I, by by the, uh, the the body language, I don't think it's necessary to vote against the resolution to give you that uh, to give you that strength. So I'll, I'll support it and, and wish you the best in the negotiations over the next month. 
Thank you, Regent Rocha. I can assure you that uh, you're not the only regent that's expressed uh, a similar concern, and I would urge you to vote in favor of it. Uh, that has been quite well vetted. And uh, President Kaler, anything you want to add to that? Yes, Chair uh, McMillan, thank you. To Regent Rocha's point, I guarantee you mm -hmm. that the uh, concerns you have expressed and the aspirations that you have outlined are closely wed to the aspirations and anticipations of the negotiating team and myself. We are we get it and we know that we cannot achieve the aspirational goals we all have for the university and for our delivery of health care and our education and our research without a strong clinical partner. And we have uh, with Fairview's leadership, James Hereford, an individual who values that those activities to the same degree we do. We do, and this is a historically unique opportunity for us to move forward together, and we don't intend to screw it up. Thank you. I have Regent Powell and then Regent Omari. I want to skip to Regent Omari and see if he has anything he wants to add on that point, or perhaps your concerns have been addressed. Uh, we can go to the Vice Chair. All right. Thank Regent you. Powell. Thank you, Chair. Very good. Regent Omari. Thank you. Uh, I'd underscore the, the part that um, uh, Regent Rocha mentioned about not planning for a divorce, but making sure that we're we're covered if if that happens. Um, so this first uh, May back in 2013 was three months after I joined the board, uh, and we've been talking about this ever since. And then a year ago, we obviously took another vote, and now here we are to extend. So I know you said you're uh, you're optimistically pessimistic. Is that what you said? I think. One of the two, you know, or, the the opposite, chair, uh, or the opposite, or the opposite. Dean Tolar, yes. Cautiously. Cautiously. There we go. Um, well, I'm glad you are. Uh, I, I can't share that same uh, of you. And so I would actually like to see um, uh, uh, something that says we'll extend this to June 30th and then that September 1 date in there uh, that Senior Vice President uh, Burnett just mentioned so that we can really make sure that we're moving this along because um, that's what you have just said that we can do. And so I would be very interested in, in putting some language in there about that as well. And before I ask somebody from the administration, perhaps the general counsel, to add some context and background there, the September 1st reference that I think I heard from General Counsel Peterson was to finalize and, and execute a binding letter of intent. Why don't you, with President Kaler, would you like General Counsel Peterson to go there, or do you want to add something? No, Mr. Chair, I certainly would turn to General Counsel for the answer to these questions. Very good. Chair McMillan, um, Regent Omari, um, the contemplated timetable would be that uh, the parties would be in a position to have boards authorize non-binding letters of intent in June that would reflect the core principles of agreement. And then with our Fairview relationship, we currently have um, multitudes of legal agreements in piecemeal, piecemeal fashion that construct the legal terms of that relationship that will need to be revised and reformed and simplified, quite frankly, in a more streamlined way. The parties anticipate um, taking the time period um, from June until September 1st, as Vice President Burnett said, to hammer all of those out. Um, you know, if the board is interested in adding an additional deadline or marker, um, my recommendation would be September 30 because the September 1 deadline that the parties are talking about is that the negotiating teams and the, the legal work will um, be at a point where it's um, ready as of September 1. I think the deadline you'd be speaking of is a deadline where the M Health relationship would um, end or lapse. And uh, I don't believe that should be the exact same day as we're contemplating on um, having agreements ready to go. So I offer that in the event the board would wish to add an additional deadline. Um, more broadly, um, getting back to Regent Roche's comment, I want to underscore what President Kaler said, which is that everybody has been coming at this with a lot of skepticism and concern and appreciating that what's at stake here is not only the 
economics of the relationship of the university with Fairview, for example, but also issues that go to um, the practice of medicine, the trust and culture questions that are at stake, particularly for the University of Minnesota physicians. And that's not something that one can resolve by way of legal documents and agreements. So um, everybody fully appreciates that. And so that's where um, the deadlines that the Board of Regents have placed in this process have been extremely helpful. And more importantly than that, the resolve that all of you have had about sort of the importance and values that the University of Minnesota bring to this medicine equation have made a sea change in the negotiations. And there has been um, certainly too much time that has elapsed, but at the same time, in the last six months in particular, the opportunity, the potential, and quite frankly, the power of the University of Minnesota in, um, in this healthcare space has been coming through in multiple directions, and hopefully um, that will come to fruition in, a, in the form of a letter of intent that's um, uh, acceptable to the to the Board of Regents, but quite frankly, um, the more um, uh, of an emphasis on mission and values and strength of the university you all can bring into this process, um, the better the university is and obviously the better the this is for the uh, state of Minnesota. So thank you for your determination and uh, no apologies needed for nay votes or deadlines or um, uh, uh, a strong sense of determination. So thank you for that. Thank you, General Counsel Peterson. And I'm gonna take a stab at expressing what I think might be a, did you have a follow-up, Regional Murray? I'll wait until you're done. Let, uh, we have ahead of us a regular June meeting. We have a special June meeting. We have a retreat and we probably have a September regular meeting Plus, the importance of this always warrants special meetings, this, this topic, if we need them. So my sense, and I don't mean to speak for the board yet, but I'm taking the temperature of the board, would be that underscoring the importance of keeping the accelerant, accelerant on this and keeping firm dates out in front of us, you get it, I'm sure our partners get it, and before we put a date in here that we might later need to change about that second step, I would like to perhaps let things evolve and you come back to us in that early, that mid-June time frame and, and update us on you know how likely that looks. So if that is expressing the sense of the board, then we wouldn't need to amend this, but I do not want to take out of Regional Mari or anybody else's the, the opportunity to further consider that. Regional Mari. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I, I, I won't need to amend this, but I'll say I don't feel confident not having a date. And it actually, what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the dates are actually helpful um, for you all in moving them. So it sounds like at least I think I saw two heads nod, so maybe two of four administrators are <laughs> saying that deadlines are good. Um, so I, I would feel much more comfortable with the September 30th deadline, but if the rest of the board doesn't think it's necessary, then I'll just leave it alone. Well, well said, Regional Murray. I do believe the administration finds the dates helpful. I just want to be sure before we put a date in, we know we've got the right date. That, that would be my sense of this. Regent Beeson, I saw a hand. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, it, it, Regional Murray really raises a good, it, dates always drive um, behaviors and decisions. And um, But I do agree with the board chair that we're going to have several more meetings together, at which time we could, we could insert a date or make a decision to go you know, a different direction or, um, um, and, and uh, so I agree with that general approach. We're gonna be talking about it uh, at, you know, at the retreat, we're maybe talking about it again in June. We're gonna have update um, um, briefings. Uh, so it is front of mind. Thank you. All right, we've uh, discussed the resolution. It's at page 62 of your docket materials and I'm sure all of you had an opportunity to uh, look it over. And uh, I would I would entertain board action at this point. Move the resolution. Very good. There's moved and seconded. Further discussion. All right. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Very good. Item uh, seven. The 
M Health resolution and extension of the master integrated structure agreement uh, is approved. While we are uh, rearranging the chairs there, we move into our committee business and we had a lengthy day of committees yesterday. We did not have our, our uh, policy and governance committee meet today, but all four of our other committees met yesterday and I will start with Regional Murray, who has an action item I know in that and Finance and Operations does as well. So would you bring your report forward? Thank you, uh, Chair McMillan. The Mission Fulfillment Committee had four action items uh, this month. Number one, the committee recommends approval for promotion and tenure recommendations for regular faculty candidate as presented by the senior academic officers of the University of Minnesota. I move approval of the promotion and tenure recommendations for regular faculty. Very good. Promotion and tenure recommendations before the board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I think we needed a second. A second. second. Oh, did I, I bypassed the second. But the Share Committee report has a second. Yeah, that's the way I've always thought of those. Where they, they come to us as pre-seconded, pre but we often second them anyway. So Perfect. Anyway, I'm not going to call for a re-vote of that, but uh, on to your second second item. Thank you, Chair McMillan. The committee uh, recommends approval for promotion recommendations for contract faculty as presented by the senior academic officers of the University of Minnesota. I move approval of the promotion recommendations for contract faculty. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded. So close. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, number three, Mr. Chair, the committee recommends approval of the annual continuous appointment and promotion recommendations for academic professionals as presented by the senior academic officers of the University of Minnesota. I move approval of the annual continuous appointment and promotion recommendations. Second. Very good. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Chair, the Your last action item. The fourth item, the committee voted to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes academic program additions, changes, and discontinuations. I move approval of the consent report. Is there a second? Second. Discussion on the consent report from Mission Fulfillment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Very Chair. good. Some information items? Nope. All right. My report. Thank you. On to our Audit and Compliance Committee, Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair McMillan. The Audit and Compliance Committee had no action items. The committee had several discussion items. First, we re reviewed the audit and non-audit services provided to the university by external audit firms, including Deloitte, who serves as our external auditor. The committee also reviewed the external audit plan for fiscal year 2000. 18. This plan sets forth the audit scope, objectives, and approach to be used by Deloitte. Chief Compliance Officer Coomer provided the committee with an update on the implementation of compliance initiatives and summaries of several completed risk assessments. He also provided an overview of U report statistics from the second half of 2017. Finally, Provost Hansen and Senior Vice President Burnett led another great discussion on the institutional risk profile. One-page mitigation plan summaries have been developed for each of the 20 risks identified in the risk profile and are included in the docket materials. The full board's agenda calls for a discussion of the risk profile at our June meeting when we will review the very good work that has been done by the administration in the development of the risk profile and more importantly, the mitigation plans. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Cohen. And on to litigation review, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Litigation Review Committee met yesterday at this meeting. We adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to attorney-client privilege. That concludes my report. Thank you. And Regent Anderson, you had a full day yesterday, you and uh, your vice chair in finance and operations. Thank you, Chair McMillan. The Finance and Operations Committee took action on six items yesterday. The committee voted unanimously to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents Policy Endowment Fund. I move adoption of that proposed amendment. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The committee voted to recommend approval of real estate transaction related to the sale of 2642 University Avenue, St. Paul. I move approval of the real estate transaction. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor of that transaction? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. 
The committee voted to recommend approval of the real estate transaction related to the sale of 0.19 acres located in the northwest corner of the University of Minnesota Morris. I move approval of the real estate transaction. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved and seconded on the Morris real estate sale. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. On to item four, Regent Anderson. The committee voted to recommend approval of the real estate transaction related to the lease of 9,383 9383 rentable square feet located within a destination medical center, Rochester. I move approval of this real estate transaction. Second. It's moved and seconded on the Rochester lease transaction. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed label, labor agreement with District Council Number 1 of the Graphic Communications Conference of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local 1B. I move approval of the resolution. Second. Moved and seconded on this, uh, this union agreement uh, for its approval. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And on to, I think, your last action item. Correct, correct. The committee voted to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes the Central Reserve's contingency allocations, the purchase of goods and services, $1 million and over, a contract for commercial paper dealer, amendments to civil service rules, an amendment to the employment agreement for the head men's basketball coach, Twin Cities Campus, an employment agreement for the head women's basketball coach, Twin Cities Campus, and an amendment to that agreement, an employment agreement for the head men's hockey coach, Twin Cities Campbell, and approval of schematic designs. I move approval of the consent report. Second. It's been moved and seconded. That's a full, full consent report, Regent Anderson. <laughs> I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Do you have any information items for us? I do not, Chair McMillan. That concludes my report. All right. That takes us uh, completing our, uh, our overview and uh, approval of everything we did yesterday and into old business. Any old business to discuss? Hearing none, I'll ask for any new business. Regent Rocha, I think your hand was up first. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask a question, and I didn't was trying to calculate if it was during the report, old business, or now. When we talked about the sale of property, there was a question about where the proceeds of the sale uh, land. Could, if, if the board office could just provide the board clarity on on when there are sales like that, uh, what what our policy is for where that that money goes. I just wanted to you know just understand that because it wasn't clear yesterday. Thank you. Senior Vice President Burnett, President Kaler, I assume we can get clarity and then Mr. Steves will get that out to us? We certainly can, Mr. Chair, Mr. Russian. Thank you. Regent Russian. Thank you. So then I saw another hand, Regent Chu, on any new business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will move, I moved a resolution to freeze resident undergraduate tuition for FY 2019 and ask for copies to be distributed. There is a second. I have to read it first. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. We need to read it. We don't need to read it if everybody has it. If you want to, I don't know if everyone's read it. I think it's been in front of everybody for the full meeting. So then I've, uh, I would open this up then to, do, do you want to provide introductory remarks? Well, I'll just say that, uh, I'll just read the last, uh, last part. Um, the Board of Regents directs resident undergraduate tuition on all campuses for FY 2019 be frozen at FY 2018 levels, uh, be it further resolved any incremental appropriation provided in the 2018 legislative session will be used in the, in the FY 2019 budget to reduce uh, resident undergraduate tuition rates across all university campuses in accord with the plan presented by the administration for approval by the Board of Regents at its t June 2018 meeting. Thank you. This proposed resolution and new business has been moved and seconded. I'm going to open it up for board uh, conversation beginning with Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm a little disappointed to see this resolution show up a new business. We had had a, another <clears throat> in the last year and a half about not bringing substantive resolutions to the board that bypass committees and um, that um, so I would hope the chair could restore some discipline to this process. Uh, this basically sort of preempts the budget decision that we're going to be making next month. 
we have public hearings, we've got processing, it's certainly not fair to the new region who, you know, I don't know if you have a certificate yet to, uh, to um, um, be holding office yet. But anyway, I just it's just really, and the modeling that you've asked for, I would like to see some modeling for an increased tuition of a quarter percent or half percent. Um, anyway, I think this is really almost out of line and I'm disappointed that we're having to uh, talk about the issue uh, after spending half a day yesterday on it. Well, I'm gonna call the board's attention to what President Kaler said in his report and that was that he is he and the senior vice president and the finance team are more than willing and able to provide us with additional modeling across a range of scenarios and region shoe i don't know why this didn't come up yesterday and it is what it is but uh, i won't uh, i won't comment on that but that is the committee of jurisdiction so i'm going to go down my my list here regent rosha thank you mr chair um my, uh, modifying my intended comments just a titch based on the, uh, the preceding um, remarks. I, I, I really, uh, I'm very disappointed by Regent Beeson's comments just now. I, I don't believe that there was ever a point where we established um, value to the institution to suppress a, the capacity to bring a conversation at any time. Um, and I would ask that we as a board uh, focus on the substance of the matter in front of us, not um, a collateral attack on the substance by a, a review of the procedure. Um, I would suggest that it is clear that bringing things through a process strengthens the likelihood of success. Um, and that when things are brought uh, uh, spontaneously, or at least appearing to be spontaneous, as it seems to be uh, here today, um, you know that that goes to the weight of the argument that's being provided, and, and the capacity of the rest of us to be comfortable with a resolution of this variety. So I would just simply ask that um, we, as a group, um, continue the progress I think we've made over these last. Uh, several years to focus on the, the substance of the discussion and, and less about the personal and procedural. That being said, um, the chair has taken my thunder a little bit um, in reference to, to the president's remarks. Um, I, 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 I did not second the resolution. I, I, as you might anticipate, support the intent and, and the, the uh, result of what this resolution would provide based on what I know now. Uh, but it was not lost on me in the president's report, um, and I think he was being responsive to a sense that members of the board would like to understand this. And so I, I don't, I, I, now going solely to the substance, and I apologize for the, the preparatory remarks, um, the, I think it would be premature to pass this as it relates to the information that we would expect to receive from the administration. And so this ultimately is being addressed by that prospect to the extent that um, that we will have options that would, I, I, I presume, would encompass uh, this, this mentality. Um, the one advantage that I could see uh, in passing a resolution of this variety, uh, particularly as we are winding down a legislative session that will end between now and June, is that if there is a, uh, a clear indication um, to the legislature that the university is going to take the efforts necessary to reach this, um, um, to, to, to minimize the amount of, of, of tuition and not have it come off as though we're um, holding, uh, holding tuition captive to that kind of support, but that we have that re uh, resolve on our own, I think that would maximize or certainly increase our likelihood of, of uh, any late improvements in, in what the appropriation might be. Uh, do I have a, any sort of assurance of that? I don't. Uh, but I think from a strategic standpoint, there would be uh, value in that. So I'm, I'm in a bit of a, of, a, of a tough spot here because I, I, I think that we do need to take the efforts, um, and make, the, make the efforts to, to, to do this. I, th I think the, the vote is premature uh, with respect to um, the president already telling us that he will bring us this opportunity back. Uh, but if we do wait and, and vote in June, we would lose that ability to signal the legislature at this point that we have that, that resolve now. So I'm, I'm very interested in the, how the of my colleagues think on this issue. Thank you, Regent Rocha. I'll go to Regent Omari. Thank you, uh, Chair McMillan. And I I'm excited to have this conversation. And so I appreciate that we're having the opportunity. I look forward um, 
you know, in, in a piece of the the models that we see from the president and his administration is really also putting in there what are the trade offs. So if we don't have the the money from tuition, does that mean that we're cutting a program, or does that mean X Y Z, whatever that might be? Um, I look forward to seeing that as well because we know that they're trade offs. And then, you know, I'll just make a couple other comments about the actual language uh, in the resolution that you know is it seems to be presented as fact, but I don't know that it actually is. Um, you know, non-essential increases in residential tuition, well, I mean, that would suggest that we just raise tuition for absolutely no reason, and, and that would is just, I believe, fundamentally false. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about increased uh, efficiencies and, and raising tuition does not automatically equate to uh, inefficiencies, right? Just like we know that we spend more money on people than we did before, but their productivity rates are up. So that would suggest that efficiency is actually up. Um, and then lastly, and, and this is probably uh, directed to our staff, to the board staff, um, while the the support of the state is fundamental and appreciated, we need to maintain that that partnership and grow it even stronger. Um, I'd be curious to look at uh, a comparison, not just by total dollars across the nation in each state, but also looking at total budget percentages that go into higher ed for one, and then two, um, total amounts of money from the state that go into things like education, health and human services, so on and so forth. And if we, in general, are a state that per capita provides more money in those buckets, should that be the comparison that we're making rather than just the overall dollar? Thank you. Thank you, Regional Mari. I want to uh, also, in a procedural reminder and a substantive reminder, the board did have a special meeting to debate and approve the requesting of an additional $10 million supplemental ask. And in that, and just to be sure the legislature knows that any money that we got from that ask, and as Regent Roshan just correctly pointed out, we don't know what that's going to be, um, was all pledged to reducing any tuition. And I see that Regent uh, Shu has that reference in his final piece as well. So I, I don't think, unless a board member speaks up, that anybody has any question about any money coming from the legislature going directly to offset any t potential tuition increase. But I just want to be sure I'm stating that, and I think I'm on safe ground saying that for the board. Regent Swiggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I think your uh, approach, your, your perspective is correct there. I, I do think that the uh, um, resolution before us presented by Regent Shu is, would be a positive message and seeing our message to the uh, our friends over in St. Paul. I, I do believe it would be a, a very positive direction to them as they enter in their last 10 days of negotiation. And, and hopefully we will find some additional resources there to, uh, to aim towards the students and, and tuition. Um, I think in the big picture, members, there's, uh, and it's, I, I was impressed with the budget which we were preliminarily given yesterday. And I said that, I, I think it's, uh, a prudent budget in the right direction. Can we do better? I think that we have two directions to go as a board as we decide how much money we're going to spend and how much money we're going to raise from students. And we can uh, we can decide, you know, uh, how much costs are going to be necessary, uh, and then we can reconcile the revenues to meet those costs, uh, which means raise tuition, reconcile the revenues to meet the costs, or we can do a more form of a budget resolution process, which I see this being saying we're only willing to raise this type of amount of money, whether it be four billion or three point nine eight or whatever it is, raise this amount of money, and we will then make the decisions necessary within the system to reconcile it that way. Uh, it's basically one or the other, and I like, I tend to like the latter process. It seems to be a more prudency. It seems to uh, bring more a little accountability. And it certainly addresses students, I think, in a better way. Uh, you know, we, we always worry, and we all worry about the student support. But, you know, bottom line is the best form that we can, best thing we can do to support students. Uh, student access, student support, student financial assistance. Best thing we can do is lower tuition. It's the best thing we can do. Thank you, Regent uh, Swigum. Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair McMillan. Um, 
I guess I'm in a slightly argumentative mood with some of my colleagues, region colleagues. But anyway, um, Region Swigum, perhaps one of the best things we can do for our students is maintain the excellence and the wonderful value of the university. So there may be some difference of opinion there. But I also want to speak to process on our board and how well our board functions. And I don't think that it's only the substance of a resolution, but it's always also how the board functions. And so I support what Regent Beeson said. I do believe that it's very important when we can to have information ahead. I believe, Regent Rocha, that you were one of the people who cared most about having review one month and action the next and not having items that came to us for review and action right away. So I think when we can, that it's very important that we not do last minute resolutions. Um, certainly, I, I think according to Robert's rules, there is new business and it's one's right. Uh, but I don't think it helps our board function in the most thoughtful way. And so um, I look forward to a substantive uh, discussion on tuition and the budget in June. Anybody that hasn't spoken yet that wants to, and I'm waiting to put my own I, I, other regents on Regent Johnson. Okay, and then I'll go to Regent Rocha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the ultimate question before us is who would not want tuition frozen or even reduced? If you asked our students, certainly they're going to say that and their parents, it's who wouldn't want a lower price for any product or service that we receive. But having started out the day here with, I'll say a celebration of achievements, and if we do not, respond to those faculty and researchers by the ability to pay them competitive salaries and benefits. My fellow board members, some of them are not gonna be here next year. And if we do what Regent Shu wants to do, it'll impact the budget of something, I believe seven to $8 million. Now that's a lot of money, but it has to come by President Kaler and Mr. Burnett, they have to find this money someplace in making these reductions. So let's be practical. I think in my calculations that a 2% equates to about $250 for a full-time student. Most of the students will not pay $250 based on scholarships and other kinds of, of uh, helps. There's also the Pell Grant and family and family help. Do we want to add to student debt? Not one of us around the table want to do that. But my fellow colleagues, this is a wonderful worldwide institution. We've heard Dr. Toller, we've heard people after people talking about it. How do we think we're going to, in a time there's inflation, there's additional costs, if we freeze the revenue source, how will President Kaler and his team manage this? I know that, you know, it sounds good. I'd love to read the headlines in the morning, you know, Regents freeze tuition, it's a great headline, but folks, we have a bigger responsibility. Due Dillon's responsibility to the people of this state to, to fund this university. We can't do much what happens over in St. Paul. We can have good working relationships, we can ask them for money, they've been okay, we wish they'd do better but I would urge that we not adopt this uh, resolution. We go through the normal budgetary process, which Regent McMillan and Vice Chair Powell have put before us, led by uh, Mr. Ant Regent Anderson, and uh, I would say that the president uh, is going to come back with some modeling in the next uh, 30 days plus, and we'll take a look at it. But to simply shut the door on uh, a tuition, uh, put a tuition freeze in place today, I think is short-sighted the, by the members of this board. So I would urge that we do not adopt this resolution. Before we talk, take up 
the procedure on what we might do, and I think there's a couple approaches. I'll let uh, Regent Roche, if you have a quick comment, and I'm mindful of time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Regent Lucas. Too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, just in response to, to Regent Cohen, I um, uh, appreciate you raising that issue, and, and I, I fully agree uh, with respect to the, the timing. I, I would note a couple things. One is I. Um, when I've raised the issue of review action, I have yet uh, to vote against you know, a matter because it was review action in a single month. I've simply raised the question as to whether it shouldn't properly be. And I think at times we've, we've converted them back. So I think that the I think my position is consistent with, with my position in the past. I would say that you're, I, I perceive your argument to, to be one that in this case, you would much prefer to go with the president's approach to coming back next month with a thought out process and so that, that you would not be comfortable in, in this environment to, to, to vote on this without that information and I think that's fair. Um, I appreciate Regent Johnson's um, articulation of his position. Um, I'm not going to respond to the specific arguments. Um, I, 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 other, I will say this, I don't think anybody that's having this conversation is suggesting that the way we would find the funds to, to, to send this message uh, to the public and to, to, to St. Paul about our resolve uh, for you know, efficient operation, um, none of us would, would suggest that that would come from our compensation for our, our world-class faculty, that there would be other ways of us identifying places where we, could, we would, would find that, those savings. That being said, I'm, I'm going to support the resolution. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not clear on what, what the, the final tally is going to be. The purpose of the vote is solely to express publicly that this is a, the direction that that I would like to see us move uh, with the administration of the institution. That being said, I, I want to make clear recognition that it is not at all a, uh, you know, a, a failure to acknowledge the, the fact that I greatly appreciate the president identifying this issue and telling us that he's going to come back with it. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a bit of a tough spot because I, I, I'm very comfortable waiting to see what, what you bring, but for the purpose of registering my position on, on the desire to, to be more assertive, I will vote for the resolution. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I'm not suggesting this as reality, but I think as long as we're modeling, we should think about what kinds of things got left out when we came to the 2%? I'm sure, you know, there, there are initiatives that we could have taken. There are um, ways that we could have uh, strengthened the university if, if the checkbook was open. So as long as you're modeling, I, I'd like to see what we, what we left out when we came to 2%. Thank you, Regent Lucas. And, and now I'm going to wait, no, Regent Swigum. We got to keep moving here, or you're going to beat me up for being long, right? Okay. You have the you have the microphone, sir. You're still far in advance of what Regent Anderson did. <laughs> <laughs> Something about this budget topic that Regent takes time. Are you canceling half his agenda? Credit <laughs> for it. Um, Please. Points made by Regent Johnson and Regent Cohen are very, very good, and I accept them. I'm agreeable to them. I just want you to be aware of the fact that at least I believe, and maybe nobody else believes, that it is not necessarily mutually exclusive to have a mission of quality and needing to raise tuition. I don't believe they're mutually exclusive. I'm, I'm sorry. I think there's other um, ways that we can address some, some cost savings. I mean, even yesterday we weren't talking about much money. It was like ten million bucks or something like that. It was, you know, in the scope of four billion, is pretty small. Um, I think this discussion is good. I, I think it shows a sensitivity that we have both to the cost of the institution, the mission of the institution, the quality, as well as to the students that pay the price. Um, I, I guess with the models that may come forward, President. As we look forward to to um, June and May, I, I, I don't want to get behind the eight ball on this and get to a position we can't change something. You know, I, I feel we get that position at times. So, if we have an opportunity to see some models and see some make some good decisions, uh, wise decisions, we may not have the same decisions. Yeah, I, I would be okay with with asking my friend across the aisle to withdraw the resolution, but. But I, I want to see a point where we absolutely have some ability to make decisions 
I didn't feel last year we had the ability to make decisions. It was all after the fact. It was all done and gone before we could give it a little input. Uh, and and I, I just, I'm, I'd like to be upfront with some of the decisions we make, some of the models. And I'm, I'm trying to play both sides here. I understand the sensitivity. I don't want to take anybody off. On the other hand, I think the direction is good. So, we just do. I, I don't know how you feel right now, but I'm. I, I think we've raised the concern enough that they, the president, here's where we're coming from. Regent Simonson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you probably know this, but this was a topic that came up many times in my meetings over the last couple of weeks, and it seemed to be tied a lot to that $10 million issue. Um, and uh, so I don't know all the facts here, but it seems like uh, that, uh, with uh, Regent Sfigum uh, saying that this would be a good move towards getting that $10 million, I don't disagree with that. I think that's a good, good thing to do. And when we're talking about, sorry to sound this way, I don't know what the 19th budget is, but the 3.9 billion, and we're talking about a few million, uh, and I'm really concerned about debt for the students. And the problems with that, I know people getting out of here with over 30000 in debt and going to work at a coffee shop, it's a problem. A failure to follow through on that debt, so I'm in support of this resolution. Thank you. I'm going to add a couple thoughts of my own here around process and the administration's role. And first of all, I uh, very much appreciate President Kaler and and Senior Vice President Burnett committing. And I'm quite certain it's a timely commitment. This is not coming up June 6th when we see stuff. It'll be in very near, near order when they're able to put together a well-detailed sense of what the consequences of a zero, a one, a two, or whatever they feel makes the most sense from a modeling standpoint, and I hope they would do that entire range between what they presented yesterday and what uh, what this motion calls for, perhaps two or three scenarios within that. So I appreciate that. I think that to Regent Swiggum's comment a minute ago that uh, you know last year was tough. Every year's gotten better since I've been on the board as we have backed up the assumptions conversation and the decision-making process, the information when I first started with you we were faced with almost no information and making a gigantic decision within the space of a month. And so we have, as a board and the administration's led on this, with some of the regents around the table, pushing to continually back up the time frame that we have to get analysis. Personally, this decision, in my mind, has to be well informed, and I can't make it without understanding the consequences that would come with additional modeling. So to me, the appropriate action by the board would be to postpone a vote on this until we have that underpinning analysis and consequential data that tells us what a zero percent tuition increase means. That's where I stand as a board member and uh, that would be a one procedural option. We could also proceed to vote on it. So, Mr. Chair, would you yield to a question? Sure. Um, so there's really kind of two dynamics here, right? The first is there's a bit of discomfort in having to vote without that model. Mm -hmm. uh, one can certainly suspect that we can do it, but, but for clarity's sake, right? The second part is it seems that some of us believe that there would be value in communicating to our state leaders that we are committed to this and that that would be advantageous. Uh, for our ability to uh, potentially uh, do better in these waning weeks of the of the session, you speak to legislators a lot. What is your perspective on the second prong of that uh, discussion? My personal perspective? Yes. I don't know that I have a super well informed one, but I think the status of the macro budget is such that it's going to be difficult for us to take any money home from that $10 million request, but I don't want to appear as though I'm thrown in the towel on that. It's very important, and the legislature realizes how important it is to help us in this mission to hold tuition flat, but I don't know, Regent Rocha, that I can opine on that. I think it's a long shot. Thank you. Regent Powell. I would just echo what the chair just said from the few conversations I've had with um, leadership. Um, I, I think it's unlikely. 
Would you turn that into a motion to postpone? Um, what I what, what I want to say is, uh, as I want to support the chair's comments, that I um, I'm not uh, not in disagreement at all with directionally with where the resolution is going. But I would very much uh, like to see um, the data uh, and the admin. I think it's better for us as a board if the administration comes forward with with proposals and rationale. I just think it's better if we if if we do it that way as opposed to a, a you know a, a sort of governance by or tuition setting by. By resolution, but that's that's. Uh, uh, I think everyone knows that I'm concerned about tuition and tuition increases, and I, and I and there's a significant uh, um, sense of the board that I think is also concerned. I would just like to see the administration uh, have the opportunity to come forward with uh, you know uh, 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 proposals and rationale for how we might do that. Regent. Uh Chu, um, before I call for a vote, uh, a last word, and please be brief. Well, I, I've got a, a lot of stuff to defend myself against here, but uh, I would just say in terms of process, um, you know, I agree every year we've done a little bit better job, but um, as we try to have these discussions on the day, same day that we have to uh, vote on the budget and pass a budget, the excuse is always, well, it's too late. We don't have the analysis for that, okay? So that was maybe a couple years ago. This past year, um, same thing every year. You know, this is my fourth budget. Um, every year we come and we say, oh, yeah, we'll do a better job next year. And we do a little bit better. This year, in fact, we did have a discussion where we, uh, in the fall, uh, finalized a number for NRNR at 15%. We also had a discussion uh, when we discussed the supplemental, which um, has the supplemental ask, um, the $10 million, which has been discussed. Um, in that vote, not all of us were there, and uh, that vote failed five, uh, five against, four, four. And uh, one of the comments um, by one of us was, one of our colleague, my colleagues, was that they wanted to have this discussion at a later time when everybody could participate. Um, we're, we're at a point in time now where the legislature is going to be in session for 10 more days unless they get extended. Uh, there's an opportunity here to, and at that time, just let me reiterate that the proposal was to, um, to freeze uh, tuition and use any supplemental monies uh, provided by the legislature to actually lower tuition. And I felt at that time uh, that that was probably a better um, deal, if you will, to propose to the legislature. Uh, following that, I've received feedback from numerous legislators that they felt that we were playing the same old game that we used to play, where we say, hey, give us more money and we'll freeze tuition, and if you don't give us the money, we're going to raise tuition. And, you know, that's just, the game hasn't worked for a while, and we went back to the same game, and I thought it was a, a mistake. Um, in terms of the process, you know, normally last year at this time, I would, I would be asking for a, a scenario or multiple scenarios that would freeze tuition, and of course they would be provided, and then, you know, they would be provided in such a way that uh, the uh, the money that uh, would have to be uh, reduced was always from key areas that nobody could support. So it's a game. I get that, and I don't want to play that game anymore. Uh, so I'd like to um, actually see us take a serious look at this because it's only $6 million. It's 0.15% of the overall budget. We have $6 million in the budget in numerous places that can be um, cut back or, and it doesn't have to come from salaries. I'm not making, there's nothing in here that says it has to come from salaries, although that's one area that can be looked at, obviously. Um, so I do think it is important that we we have a, um, a vote on this today because there is an opportunity to go back to the legislature and tell them that we in fact have um, on our own frozen tuition. It, it brings us, uh, I, I think it would bring us more credibility in terms of our uh, intention to uh, manage um, the finances of the university in a way that uh, limits uh, or even kind of in the future can reduce tuition with the help of the legislature. So um, I guess with that, I will ask for a roll call vote. 
Roll call votes have been requested. Mr. Steves, I'll ask you to call the roll. Um, Mr. Chairman, while he does, I, can I just quickly, while he does that? I'm. All right, Regent Omari, last word before the roll call vote begins. The, the challenge with this you is You seconded the motion, so. By voting no, it suggests that we don't want to freeze tuition, right? right? And so, uh, really, your intent to signal if this gets voted down is actually signaling the entire opposite, <laughs> other than for those who vote yes, right? Or perhaps for yourself. And so, that's the big challenge. And then, particularly, I'll come back to this, like, non-essential increases is, is just language that fundamentally is not true. So that's all I wanted to say. We're going to call the vote. M Mr. Chair, point of order, does Regional Mari, is he looking to table the motion till June? I've already suggested that we postpone our table, and I have no one pick that up, so. No, Steve seconded it. Steve seconded No, no. No. Oh, Steve seconded it. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought the motion was... to table is in order, if that's what you're suggesting. Yeah, yes, absolutely. You're suggesting a motion to postpone. Yes. Which is a procedural motion that requires a simple majority. And if it gets seconded, then we would do that before the roll call vote. Uh, yes. Is there a second? I, I, I have a question. Well, is there a second on the motion to postpone? I want to keep our procedure correct here. I don't hear one. So that fails. All right. So. Regent Anderson on before the roll call vote. Well, my question was on <laughs> once the legislature makes their decision, the last part of it doesn't make sense, so the resolution would not have been, you know, it says if you give us more money, we'll, you know, free. So it didn't make sense if we had that vote after the legislator has made their decision, in my opinion. Oh. I would caution anybody from using whatever comes of the vote that Mr. Steves is going to begin momentarily to signal anything, as Regional Mari just said. It's it's not, I don't think it should be a signaling device right now if it doesn't pass, but who knows? We'll see. Re, uh, Mr. Steves, please begin the roll call vote. On the SHU resolution to freeze resident undergraduate tuition for fiscal year 2019, Regent Anderson? No. Regent Anderson votes no. Regent Beeson? No. Regent Beeson votes no. Regent Cohen? No. Regent Cohen votes no. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Johnson? No. Regent Johnson votes no. <clears throat> Regent Lucas? No. Regent Lucas votes no. Regent Omari? No. Regent Omari votes no. Regent Powell? No. Regent Powell votes no. Regent Rocha? Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? No. Regent Swiggum votes no. Chair McMillan? No. Chair McMillan votes no. There's probably going to be a recount. The motion, the shoe motion to adopt the resolution to freeze resident undergraduate tuition fails on a vote of three to nine. Move to adjourn. I move. There's a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, the Board of Regents stands adjourned.